Astonishing Legends is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard on this podcast. Astonishing Legends would like to thank the Great Courses Plus, Squarespace, Health IQ, Best Fiends, our contributors at Patreon.com, and you, our listeners, for making tonight's show possible. Tonight, we go back to a place we've been before. A place longtime listeners of our show will be quite familiar with. After all, we've mentioned it several times on the air. That place is Hopkinsville, Kentucky. Surely you remember it. It is the home to one of the most famous alien encounters that has ever happened in the United States. The Kelly Hopkinsville encounter. You'd think that would be enough for one small town in rural southwestern Kentucky. But it turns out, this little town has not one, but two very prominent claims to Astonishing Legends history. And as far as we can tell, they're unrelated. Hopkinsville turns out to be the birthplace of a man known the world over as the Sleeping Prophet. Edgar Casey was born there on March 18, 1877. His family was prominent in the area. The Caseys used to own all of the lands between Hopkinsville and the Tennessee border 15 miles west, but a slew of kids and grandkids had divvied that up into nothing by the time Edgar came along, so he resorted to making a living as a photographer. Edgar was more than just a photographer, however. He was what noted author Mitch Horowitz referred to as an uneasy mystic in his 2015 introduction to the reprinting of Thomas Sugru's book on Casey, There is a River. And this description is fitting, because if you believe the legendary tales about Casey, then you'll know he had a gift for healing the sick that we would like to say is unparalleled in history. But in fact, there were others before him. They're just largely forgotten now, and their stories were not nearly as well documented. We'll, of course, bring them to your attention in this series. Casey had discovered as a young man that he could lay down on a couch and put himself under hypnosis, during which it was as if another voice or representative of the global collective unconsciousness would speak through him, referring to itself or themselves as we. These entities, whatever they were, seemed omniscient. They could diagnose both remotely and directly any condition that any person had, describing it with minute anatomical detail. Then, this voice that came through Casey's body would go on to describe a solution to the person's problem if one could be found. Herein lies the hang-up for most of the skeptics, and rightfully so, we imagine. Casey's solutions left no healing discipline, from the scientific to the esoteric, out of the equation. The solutions presented were indiscriminate in that way. But that didn't seem to matter because the truth was that according to the approximately 14,000 readings he conducted for the injured and ailing, many of those who were able to follow the treatment instructions given by Casey made recoveries that could safely be termed as miraculous. How could Edgar Casey be doing this? He hadn't completed school past the ninth grade, and he had no medical or anatomical knowledge of any kind. Is this story all just a bunch of hooey, as one skeptic in Sugaru's book said? Or is there something more to it? Welcome back to Astonishing Legends. I'm Scott Philbrook, and this is Forrest Burgess. You may take care of the fee any way convenient to yourself. Please know one is not prohibited from having a reading because they haven't money. If this information is of a divine source, it can't be sold. If it isn't, then it isn't worth anything. Edgar Casey to a blind laborer seeking a reading. Join us tonight for the first part of a three-part series on the sleeping prophet, Edgar Casey. And the entity is back. Oh, that's very nice. I don't think he ever used the word entity, though. Casey? Yeah. Oh, you're going to find out, my friend. Well, all in the, the readings time. that I read, he said, and he said, we have the body. 
we have uh, the body. Well, yeah, we're going to get to all that good stuff, but that's one of the more freaky things about this story for me, or just really fascinating. But I guess, in a way, technically you are right, because it was the information coming through Casey that yes. said entity. Maybe well, and also Casey I himself. shouldn't say what he said, because I've not read the 14,000 <laughs> readings. I've not even read more than a few dozen of them. So I no, am, we're gonna I'm get not to that equipped. Old, yeah. yeah, we're not going to get there. That's anyway, okay. I, I, honestly, man, I cannot believe it's 2020. Me I mean, it's neither. You, you know, I, I have this vague, far off, foggy Christmas figgy pudding memory of us <laughs> doing, you were stuck on a plane and oh, there was yes, family members. Yes, that was... Uh, Santa was insulting you. Uh, <laughs> there was jingling and music. And then next thing I know, I'm back in the studio and it seems like uh, either a thousand years ago or yesterday. I can't even tell. I, You know, for me, the weird part about it all is the fact that it's 2020. I actually remember a, a long time back when Conan O'Brien first came on the air with his mm -hmm. show. He had this recurring sketch, which I think you and I have talked about before, <laughs> called In the <laughs> yeah. Year 2000, right? And, well, and of course, yeah, yeah. the joke was it was the year 2000 wasn't that far away. Uh, no. In fact, I think it was past 2000 already, but... but and uh, they kept doing it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, but now it's... Uh, it's Freaking 2020. It's I crazy know. to me. Well, it was a little Christmassy. I think the the uh, the costume had Christmas, uh, chrome Christmas balls glued to a collar. Yeah, yeah. And then that was the futuristic thing. But yes, yeah. that was the running gag. But it's it's amazing. And I think that their their part of the joke was that, you know, the year 2000 seems far off when it is a few years away or a decade away. And then boom, it's here. And then it's gone. And that's the way I feel about 2020. It's like that's Blade Runner was supposed to happen last year. 2019 yeah. and it didn't yeah, yeah. and on top of that yeah, november 2019 they, and a lot of people you know kids even in high school won't remember the y2k scare there was the whole like <laughs> there was this <laughs> global know. panic well it, maybe it was most of the u.s that no computer was programmed to handle when it went from 1999 to 2000 yeah. all the atms were going to crash people were freaking out and backing things up and taking things offline and then when it happened yeah. it, like nothing happened Nothing happened. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah, but I'll tell you, it's it's kind of like, in a way, it's like the nuclear bomb. Scientists, smart people, much smarter than us put together, weren't sure what was going to happen, and that's the way it was. No, but, I was just going to say, here's a note for our listeners, because we like to help out the more you know. Um, yeah. Frank Abagnale, who was the Catch Me If You Can guy, the <laughs> check forger or whatever, I follow he's him because he's kind of a yeah. genius, yeah. Uh -huh. He said to be sure this year, if you're writing checks or putting dates down on contracts, to go ahead and write out 2020, because if you just put 20, it's easy yeah. to add any two digits to the end of it and change the date of something. So well, there's there our go. note for you guys who are out there signing contracts and writing checks, which I guess would mean that... You're doing fairly well. You would do <laughs> No one's just signing make sure anything you're right. Anymore, no, they Scott. probably aren't. But just put the With year 2020. Yeah. Put, put all four digits. That's all. For us specifically, in October, this coming October, this show will be six years old. Isn't that weird? Yeah, that that's crazy. I re I felt like for the first two years we were we didn't even know if it was ever going to generate any income. <laughs> no, I mean, it didn't. We were right about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I mean, and yeah, well, if, if we make it to over seven years, that'll be the longest I've ever worked at the same company. <laughs> well, you have not put your time in into the post-production pits of hell, my friend. Oh, no, no, no. I, I was an editor for 17 years, but I left, <laughs> I bounced around and I, and I freelanced yeah. and all this stuff. But the longest I was ever at a shop was a uh, one in New York, which I'm still very good friends with the guys there. But uh, that was seven years, I think, before I wound up uh, leaving to move back yeah. to Los Angeles from New York with my wife. So. Well, well, we'll try one post place uh, for, for like 15 or 20 years. It'll seem like did every session is seven years long. I. Well, our editor for tonight's show, we did work at a place for since 93, and I think we stopped in the year 2000. Wait, there you go. Yeah, yeah. The year that's 2000 a good comes back yes. up again. Yes, we do. We have a, a new editor on the show tonight because Sarah is on maternity leave. Godspeed, Sarah. We can't wait to see you when you come back. But uh, we would like to welcome Chris Potter to the fold. His company is called Rumble Jar. If mm -hmm. you're interested in editorial services for your podcast or anything else, he has a ton of experience in uh, professional experience, radio, all that kind of stuff. So <laughs> yeah, uh, way better than uh, he's slumming with us. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> just he's, like Sarah was, frankly. <laughs> yeah, basically, I'm calling a huge favor, and uh, just because uh, Sarah is out. But yeah. uh, well, uh, do you have anything to tell us for this new year? Um, well, I just want to say again, thank you for sticking with us, especially mm. those of you who have been listening to us from the beginning. I'm always amazed whenever I make an announcement or say something about how long we've been doing it on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, how many people are like, oh yeah, I've been with you since the beginning. I'm like, really? You stuck around after that <laughs> those first couple yeah. of 
yeah. of disaster episodes. Thanks again. We are excited about 2020, frankly. We got a lot of new stuff going on, although I'm prohibited from discussing any of it in great detail because Forrest thinks that backs us into a corner. Which it does because that you know then we'll have to uh, drop an apology into the feed, into the RSS feed. <laughs> we said we were going to do uh, this and it never happened. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, or that's the that's the next show's cold open. So I prefer if you just didn't say everything that we're going to do in stone for the rest of the year here. Let's okay. just uh, well, can play I just say you. we're going to do stuff. Okay, that's good. Okay, we're doing stuff. Uh, I do want to say thanks to all the people who listened to our other new show that we launched last year called The Midnight Library. It had over 175,000 downloads for the first eight episode season. So that's pretty awesome. And we've decided to produce a second season of it for your listening pleasure. That season's going to be 13 episodes instead of eight. And the first one will premiere the first Sunday in April. Now, we know that seems like a ways off for those of you who are fans of the Midnight Library, but trust us, it will be here before you know it. And of course, we're going to keep reminding you about it. Yeah, I really do enjoy that show. There's something about it that's so familiar to me, but uh, (laughs) really, it's quite a different flavor from us. So that should be appealing in and of itself. Yes, and mercifully short compared to us as well. Oh, indeed. That's probably the, uh, one of the better selling points here. Well, that about covers the housekeeping for tonight, does it not? Because we've been rambling on here for a bit. Yeah, especially since you won't let me talk about any of the fun stuff we're doing this year. Ah, uh, of course. Well, that uh, that's just that's just common sense here. <laughs> and all bridges we can cross when we come to them, my friend. Indeed. Point well made and taken. So let's head back to one of our favorite little towns, Hopkinsville, Kentucky. So, who was Edgar Casey? Well. Edgar Casey was an American man best known for what others have termed clairvoyant abilities. Is there is there a reason you're already sounding like Casey Kasem? Is it Casey yes, Edgar Casey? Is. <laughs> Can you think of Casey? <laughs> Edgar Casey Kasem. Ooh, that's a good connection. Well, yeah. I mean, it's probably tricking your mind. Before you get way down the <laughs> rabbit hole here, I yeah. want to talk about the word clairvoyance. We say it all the time, but we don't really think about it, you know? No, you made a good point right there. And I, as you'll see in the outline here... I have made some definitions, uh, stuck them in there as we're discussing, because yeah, these are terms that things when we hear the new age and, and the stuff like holistic medicine and naturopathy, and we hear these terms all the time, but maybe we don't know really what they mean. I certainly needed a refresher course. So let's talk about some of these terms we're going to be hearing tonight. And it's funny too, because I, like I've said on the show before, I took four years of French in high school, which means absolutely nothing. I can't remember anything about it, but uh, clairvoyance is clear view, clear vision, mm, which you can right. understand when you think about it. Oh, yes, voyeur, voyance, clair, clear. Clair. And, yeah, French, clair, meaning clear, and voyance meaning yeah. vision. This is actually from the Wikipedia page on clairvoyance. Right. This mm-hmm. is the ability to gain information about an object, person, location, or physical event through extrasensory perception, which is also known as ESP. One of my favorite things to talk about, I can't believe we actually have not ever really done a show on ESP. We've talked about Kreskin's ESP, yeah. which I bought an old version of off of eBay. I have it here. Uh, and my great-grandmother and I used to, she used to try to get me to see if I had ESP with the cards like they use in Ghostbusters. I've mentioned that before on the show. So anyway, any person who has claimed to have such ability is actually said to be a clairvoyant, which is one who sees clearly. Uh-huh. Claims for the existence of paranormal and psychic abilities such as clairvoyance have not been supported by scientific evidence published in high-impact factor peer-reviewed journals. Parapsychology explores this possibility, but the existence of the paranormal is not accepted by the scientific community. Parapsychology, well, yes. Yeah. Parapsychology, including the study of clairvoyance, is an example of pseudoscience. And uh, now that's and I'm again I'm reading Wikipedia there, which likes to put uh, the word pseudoscience on pretty much every entry that we talk about on <laughs> even, Astonishing Legends. Yeah, <laughs> e- even, well, it's it's in every, they they work it in there on every page, actually. You just have to look for it. It's like a little Easter egg because yeah. they love that term. Yeah, they, that and quackery is another one. Yes. Uh, all the terms that we're going to encounter tonight, because a lot of this, this story here does touch on that kind of stuff. Uh, and we have to talk about it. it is how it is viewed. And it's an essential part of the debate whether you are willing to accept this or not. So that is part of it. Which, by the way, I wanted to, (laughs) because I'm fond of articulate insults, Forrest. I don't know if you saw this, but someone on Twitter was, he was was suggesting a show to a friend, or I don't know if he knew the person or not, or he or she. I can't, I can't remember what their handle was. But they were recommending some other show to Twitter, and they said that it was, 
a perfect anecdote to the venally gullible Astonishing Legends. Venally gullible. Wow. So I had to look wow. up venally. Um, yeah. Yeah, give uh, us that definition. Did you, yeah, in a corrupt or deceitful manner, open to bribery, Ooh. mercenary, Ooh. characterized by corrupt dealings, especially bribery. The archaic <laughs> definition is obtainable yeah. for a price. So I would like to thank that Twitter person for uh, recommending the Counterpoint podcast yeah. to, uh, to our well, venal corruption from this well, I'll thin say this voice right control now. freak that I am. <laughs> I'll say this right now. I'll take any bribe to believe anything. How's that? <laughs> Send me a check. Preferably a money order or actually cash. Yeah. And I'll just uh, jump on whatever bandwagon you want. Well, uh, as we'll see in part two of this series, not to give anything away, but we will look at the more controversial aspects of Casey's career and legacy because for a guy that did most of his business in the 20s and 30s, we're discussing stuff that he encountered back then, things that are ancient Far Eastern concepts, but not really known well. And he introduced them to this audience just after the turn of the century, and we're still talking about this stuff today. So he is very relevant, I think. Yeah, I, I agree. He's still he's still at the forefront of this material. Well, let's go back. Let's take a look at his history and his childhood and uh, how he got started and what his young life was like. Right. Well, during his most active period of giving what was called readings, that was the term for the sessions that he would do, uh, and this was later in his life, he gave these readings to thousands of people for over 40 years of his adult life. And what he would do is he would lie on a couch and enter a meditative sleep-like state with his eyes closed and his hands folded over his stomach, just like he was about to take a nap. Now, some have described it as a trance-like state. I want to mention here, we're going to say the word trance, but I'm not sure that that's exactly how he would have described it himself. I didn't really come across, uh, no, of course, and, there's so much reading to be done here. Yeah, and in the material, in the book I read, which you told me would be a quick read what, that was actually 425 <laughs> pages, and yes, oh, I read it. I actually couldn't put it down. It was, it was a lot yeah. of fun to read. But in that book, he makes clear that when other people use the word trance to describe it, at least it, it seemed like in Thomas Sugru's book that we'll right. be talking about, that he went out of his way to say that he was hypnotized, not in a trance. So he, he didn't seem to, he didn't seem to like, he didn't express a disdain for it in the book, but he didn't seem right, to like right. the word trance to your, to your point. Yeah. Well, that's what I wanted to say here. Sometimes it's easier just to say trance and have people understand what you're talking about, but not like you see in the movies where somebody's got their eyes bugged wide open and they're catatonic almost and walking around like a zombie. That's not what we're talking about in when we say trance here. Well, yeah, in a trance, like I'm looking at the definition of it right now in Merriam-Webster, a sleep-like state usually characterized by partly suspended animation with diminished or absent sensory and motor activity. Uh, also, it says a state of profound abstraction or absorption. Mm. It's not a 100% off the mark for him, but the first definition says a stupor or a daze, which I don't think is how he would characterize the condition he was in during the readings. No, as we'll see here, how he described it later on when he was asked about it, and this phenomenon was kind of strange to himself as well, is that it was like a sleep, but unlike when he went to sleep or any of us go to sleep at night, not like that kind of sleep, but kind of a deeply meditative state where he actually wasn't aware of what he was saying. In any case, we just want to say up front here is that we, we may say the word trance, but really you have to think about it as it will have been described here in our narrative. So really the first thing that he would do in these sessions, he would lie down, as we say, close his eyes, and then he would begin to make observations about and recommendations to the person who had asked for the reading while in this sleep-like state, this deeply meditative state. And this request usually was submitted in a letter giving Casey their name and location. That was for most of his career anyway. Sometimes the person uh, starting off in his career would be in the room with him, but he actually didn't need them to be there. Well, his secretary would then transcribe Casey's comments and the reading would be delivered to the subject for a nominal fee. And this was mostly to pay for the transcriber's time and then later when the workload increased to help pay for his supporting his family uh, because you're doing this all day long. You can't give them all out for free if it's taking up all your time. Well, in the beginning... 
mostly the recommendations were about helping to heal a physical or emotional ailment for which Casey would prescribe what might nowadays be called a holistic or naturopathy treatment. And just quickly, I want to give a shout out to the secretary and stenographer. Her name was Gladys Davis. And, yes, yes. Uh, during the process of trying to find somebody who could do the stenography, because this, I thought this was interesting. Mm -hmm. um, he talks when he's in this state in incomplete sentences. There's a lot of pauses. It's very hard to transcribe live. And she was the only one who could do it really well and keep it true to the nature of what he was actually saying. That's yeah. how she managed to do that for 20 plus years. So, Yeah, as we'll see. Did you know that she was only 18 when she started with him? No, that's interesting. <laughs> they didn't mention her age in Su Sugru's book, but they, okay. they did make a note. I mean, it was a different time. They did make a note that she was very attractive blonde. So oh, <laughs> that's nice. Well, she became such a integral part of his process that she ended up being kind of a member of the family, as we'll see. Well, getting back to these terms, dictionary.com describes the concept of holism, like holistic holism, as, quote, incorporating the concept of holism or the idea that the whole is more than merely the sum of its parts in theory or practice, as in holistic psychology, end quote and in the field of holistic medicine as, quote, identifying with principles of holism in a system of therapeutics, especially one considered outside the mainstream of scientific medicine as naturopathy or naturopathy or chiropractic and often involving nutritional measures. That sums up a lot of his practice completely, I think, just not using or turning to pharmaceuticals immediately to cure everything, which sounds appealing to me and a lot of people these days. And Dictionary.com would go on to define naturopathy as, quote, a system or method of treating disease that employs no surgery or synthetic drugs, but uses special diets, herbs, vitamins, massage, etc., to assist the natural healing processes, end quote. So that all sounds appealing. During this time when this stuff wasn't really thought about, here's Edgar Casey suggesting this stuff which might be called folk medicine. Actually, it probably was, I think. And some of his critics would say that's only what it was, just folk medicine with very Right, which very is a particularly properties. dismissive label, you know, you yeah. know, and maybe it's appropriate. Here's the point, though, that uh, was actually made by us in the Voynich Manuscript episode where they find a medieval cure that has astounding antibiotic properties to it. And this is a recipe from the 1500s, I believe. Remember we talked about that? Yes, and they're absolutely. like, And who nowadays are they? Oh, come on. They, didn't, they were ignorant back then and dirty and they smelled and they didn't know what they were doing. Well, it turns out there's knowledge out there that not everybody knows and new things are being discovered all the time. What Casey was prescribing, and we'll talk about some of his curative properties here and poultices uh, later on, is that it wasn't a traditional Western medicine approach. And so he still gets criticism to this day. But really for me, Scott, the other thing that's even more fascinating than what the effect was of some of his treatments that came to him was that during many readings, Casey would also make comments about a person's past life or lives within their historical context and how it was affecting or connected to their current state and how that might be affecting their health. Once observers noticed that he was commenting on historical circumstances with a mystical bent, he was then asked questions not just about health, but all sorts of mysteries, like uh, things like Atlantis or ancient Egypt and how the pyramids were built, the story of Jesus, reincarnation, angels and spirits, the Akashic record and karma, and wars and future events. Or even people would ask him, what is my purpose in life? And this is just to name a few things that he would be talking about in this sleep-like state. I was about to say somnambulistic, but I think you have to get up and walk around for that. Uh, yeah, well, that's, Casey, that's actual yeah, sleep so. walking or mo practicing the use of motor yes. skills while you're asleep, yeah. right? Yeah, I would I would guess from the, uh, I'm not a linguist, but the, the bulance part, like ambulance. Yes. Somnambu, bu, the, the bu part is that connotes uh, your, your ambulatory. Yes. Somnambulism, the act of walking about with the performance of apparently purposive acts while in a state intermediate between sleep and waking. Well, I'll buy that. Anyway, well, Casey claimed, and this is interesting, that once he came out of his meditative sleeping state, he had no recollection of what he had just said, and that some of his ideas, he said and expressed, during it made him ill at ease, since it conflicted with his own fundamentalist Christian beliefs. 
And if you believe that, that's interesting. Yeah, and this is, we'll be talking about it, but this is a devout yeah. Christian man here. Uh, yes, very yeah. much so, very yeah. much so. Uh, always remained and was maybe able to reconcile it. I'll leave that as a mystery. Uh, <laughs> but when asked about where this information was coming from during this sleep-like state, uh, he generally stated that he was able to put his mind in contact with a timeless, spaceless, universal consciousness, or what some would call the, quote, superconscious mind, end quote, or the Akashic Record, or Akashic. Uh, the Akashic Record is usually how I hear it, uh, which is described in its Wikipedia entry as, quote, a compendium of all human events, thoughts, words, emotions, and intent ever to have occurred in the past, present, or future. It's believed by theosophists to be encoded in a non-physical plane of existence, known as the etheric plane, and the word itself is derived from the Sanskrit word akasha or akasha. I think that's got the line over the A, so it's acacia, maybe, uh, meaning ether, sky, or atmosphere. Similarly, in Islamic theology, there is what is called the preserved tablet, which is described as, quote, the heavenly preserved record of all that has happened and will happen. I, I just, I love that definition. I would love to get my hands on I that. I know. Yeah. Well, and there's a lot of things that are really fascinating about that. One is, it's interesting to me how similar that description is to Einstein's idea that time is not linear, but occurs all yeah. at once. Yeah. And that yeah. we perceive it as linear because that's how that's how we can handle it. And coming back to a book that we're going to mention several times tonight, There is a River, the story of Edgar Cayce, which is the, uh, it also says in the title, The Landmark Biography of the Modern Prophet by Thomas Sugru. That was published originally by Holt Reinhardt and Winston. It was republished again by Penguin Random House. We'll be referring to that book a lot. And then the 2015 edition of that book, the author Mitch Horowitz did the forward for it. Hey, can you tell our audience just before I go into this yeah. a little bit about Mitch? Because you went and actually saw him. I did at the Philosophical Research Society building. Actually, it's, uh, yeah, the PRS, but it's also the University of Philosophical Research now, founded by Manly P. Hall, another dude who we got to cover. He's fascinating. Uh, compiled a ton of esoteric and mystical knowledge when he was like 19 or 21, or finished it by the time he was 21. It's a thick volume, and Mitch was giving a talk about this, and he is a rockin' cool dude. Very punk. He, you would love him because of his punk rock aspect. I know. It, I wanted uh, to. I've heard whatever. I remember I couldn't go with you when you went to that that night, because yes. we've attended other things there together, which were a lot of fun. Yeah. It's, a, it's an amazing place over in uh, Los Feliz in Los Angeles. But Just a yeah. super informed guy. He's a, he's a mystic himself, and maybe he would describe himself as an occultist, but an author and lecturer. He doesn't take any notes. He just rattles it all off. And like I said, he's wearing a Misfits t-shirt, motorcycle boots, and has lots of tats. And <laughs> <laughs> he's he, he's so cool. Anyway, yeah. uh, I talked with him and and he said he would love to come on the show, but you know, I, I probably just to get rid of me because I was maybe being a guest. <laughs> I don't know. Well, he's a busy guy. He's an editor at Penguin, or was at least so, and and a journalist. He's frequently published. So yeah, he's he's, he's dude. doing a lot of stuff, and he's still working with the PRS here in Los Angeles. So he is very busy, but he also does the narration for the audiobook version of There Is a River. Anyway, what I was going to say is from the introduction to the Kindle edition, at least that I have, and also the paperback, mm -hmm. the, the 2015 Kindle edition of the book, of Thomas Suger's book, Horowitz describes the origin of the idea of the Akashic Record, and he points out that it was popularized in the Western world by the founder of Theosophy, somebody uh -huh. we've mentioned on the show several times, Madam H.P. Blavatsky. Who oh, has, yeah. There's a lot of amazing names in tonight's episode, by the way. Hers has always <laughs> yes. been one of my favorites. When she published a book called Isis Unveiled, and she was the generation before Casey. And in fact, that book came out the year that he was born, 1877, which is pretty interesting. But I want to quote this section that Mitch Horowitz wrote in the introduction of Thomas Sugru's book, the 2015 edition. Quote, in Blavatsky's 1877 study of occult philosophy, Isis Unveiled, the theosophist described an all-pervasive magnetic ether that, quote, keeps an unmutilated record of all that was, that is, or will ever be, end quote. These astral records, wrote Blavatsky, preserve, quote, a vivid picture for the eye of the seer and prophet to follow, end quote. Blavatsky equated this archival ether with the Book of Life from Revelation. 
So I thought that was pretty interesting. Another thing that Horowitz pointed out in that introduction was that Casey said he had been visited four times by a mysterious turbaned spiritual master from the East, a Mahatma or great soul. And it was one of the same ones that apparently had guided Madame Blavatsky as well. Here's a connection, though, to other topics that we've talked about. We're also very interested in remote viewing and in Lori Williams' course, Controlled Remote Viewing, which we've talked about a lot on the show. Students will ask her, well, where is this information coming from? How are people able to describe things that they're, you know, are miles away on the other side of the planet, off the planet, on other planets? And she'll just say, well, some people think it is part of the Akashic record. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of common believe. ground here between yeah. what, what Casey was doing and the skill that she teaches. By the way, we just got an email yesterday. Somebody was asking, where, how can I get connected with that? If, if you are looking to take one of those classes, the introductory class, it's pretty amazing. Forrest did it. Um, I'm supposed to do it. I've yet to have time, but I want to do right. it soon. You can go to intuitivespecialists.com to uh, check that out, intuitivespecialistsplural.com. Anyway, yeah. well, I hope that uh, we advance so far one day that we get a, a cool nickname. The nickname for Edgar Casey is the Sleeping Prophet, as you said in the beginning of the show, because it was his sleep like method of receiving this esoteric information that led Casey biographer, and I think that was Jess Stern. Yes. Uh, that was the title of the book. Well, that, that name stuck. So he's known as America's Prophet or America's Sleeping Prophet or just the Sleeping Prophet. And in the decades of Casey's ongoing sessions, with some readings going back as far as 100 years, although most were concerning holistic health treatments, he delivered statements on over 10,000 different topics. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, that's pretty uh, As the Casey researchers and students have compiled and indexed the entire collection of his 14,306 readings, they have been categorized into the following five subject groups. One, health-related information. Two, philosophy and reincarnation. Three, dreams and dream interpretation. Four, ESP and psychic phenomena. And five, spiritual growth, meditation, and prayer. Edgar Casey founded a nonprofit organization in 1931 called the Association for Research and Enlightenment, or ARE, which is still active today, and whose website is edgarcasey.org. And uh, it's a really kind of a terrific group. You feel really uh, welcomed. You, you can join it. Uh, they're very open about it. Uh, their website gives access to the entire database collection of his 14,306 readings in its members-only section. And the public can also access all the readings by visiting the ARE's physical library, which is open to everyone daily, and that is at the visitor center at their headquarters campus located in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Now, since Casey introduced ancient Eastern practices and concepts like holistic health, auras, meditations, and soulmates as a mean towards spiritual growth to Americans and the Western world for the first time in the 1930s and 40s, he's thought of by many as the father of holistic medicine and the real founder of much of the beliefs and practices of the New Age movement. And I know New Age has gotten a bad rap. And, and in some cases, that's probably justified. It's a good uh, genre of music. I'll tell you that for nothing. <laughs> right. Oh, New Age music? <laughs> yeah. Yes, certainly. Very soothing. Yes. But yeah, so really, yes, there are probably some silly things about the New Age movement. But what I find fascinating, and if, you know, without generating a smirk, is that Edgar Casey was espousing some of these ideas, not in the, the silly 80s or the 90s. He was doing this in the 19... 15s, 16s, 17s, at the very start of it, into the 1920s and 30s and the 1940s, the first half of the 1940s. So that's significant in my view. There are two main biographies of Edgar Casey. One of them is titled, as you said, There is a River. That was written in 1942 and published in 1943 and written by Thomas Joseph Sugru. And that's one place where we're going to draw a lot of information. There's a really great Wikipedia entry on Edgar Casey, which takes a lot of its information from that book. So it kind of mirrors the timeline that we're all going to do here because it is a, you know, a live story that was pretty well documented. And in fact, he is considered maybe the most documented psychic of the 20th century. So that's something. 
They say you shouldn't make New Year's resolutions that are so grand, you're not going to keep them, and then you're just going to be disappointed in yourself. Well, I had a resolution to be finished producing this episode by now, and I'm disappointed for both of us. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's a resolution that might sound big, but it's really one that's easy to keep and actually a lot of fun, and that's to keep learning something new every day if you have to. Uh, you're right, and a really easy way to do that and have a ton of fun doing it is with the Great Courses Plus. And whether that means discovering new interests or expanding your knowledge on specific topics you've always been interested in, the Great Courses Plus has you covered. This is the one online learning service that offers thousands of lectures covering everything from history to science, business to personal development, and the list goes on. There's something for everyone. And every course is taught by the best professors and experts from top universities and institutions around the world. So this is reliable information we can all trust. Yeah, and like with everything they offer, there are so many connections to what we're all learning about on the show. For example, with our latest course on the big history of civilizations, Professor Benjamin starts the series off by talking about the ancient city of Jericho. Remember when we mentioned it on our Gebekli Tepe episodes? Oh yeah, first inhabited about 14,000 years ago, and there's still a community living there today, currently known to be the oldest continually occupied city on Earth. And what's interesting in this first lecture is the comparison to another ancient city called Anal, located in modern-day Turkmenistan, which is one of the earliest large human settlements, but it was deserted long ago. So why did Jericho survive and Anal didn't? Because Jericho always had its own reliable source of water for its entire history. This stuff is so fascinating to me, I'm not going to have any trouble keeping this resolution to keep on learning. And you can too, just by doing what we're doing, and set a goal to learn more this year. Just sign up for the Great Courses Plus today. Our listeners get a free trial of unlimited access to the entire library. Sign up using our special URL today to get started. Don't wait. Go to the Great Courses Plus dot com slash legends. Remember, that's the Great Courses Plus dot com slash legends. <laughs> I'm James A. Willis, and when I'm not out doing something strange and spooky, like wandering around Waverly Hills with Forrest searching for my doppelganger, I'm doing exactly the same thing you are, listening to Astonishing Legends. Now, back to the show. Yeah, and the interesting thing about this book, it was originally published by Holt, Reinhardt, and Winston, and then it was republished recently by Penguin Random House. I, I, and I'm not sure what's if Holt, Reinhardt, and Winston is still around or got folded into something else, but... Um, sounds like a law firm. Yeah, it's well, I remember that name. I feel like I had a <laughs> yes. lot of textbooks by them in, yes, in exactly. college maybe. But the other thing is that I had read about Mitch Horowitz was that he was an editor for a division of Penguin, which makes sense yeah, as to that's why right. he did the opening uh, or the introduction here. But this book, Thomas Joseph Sugru's book, is the one that made Casey internationally famous. And I wanted to talk a little bit about Sugru just to get some background because it's important to know where people are coming from when you're taking this much material from them. Uh, Sugru attended Washington and Lee University. That's actually the ninth oldest institution of higher learning in the United States. And he went there with Edgar Casey's son, Hugh Lynn Casey. It's right next to VMI, interestingly. I had oh. actually hadn't heard of it until uh, we started doing the research on this show. Mm -hmm. It's a liberal arts school. Now, Hugh had told Thomas about his dad, and he was interested to meet him because Thomas Sugru was convinced he could debunk the fraud. Ah, I love that. Yeah. And so if you go again on the Wikipedia here, which, you know, we're, we're pulling a lot of because uh, there's a lot of information from different sources to pull in here. And like like we said, we have a lot coming directly from Sugru's book, but also coming from other books. But this is an interesting thing to note about Sugru himself. Eventually, he came down with a form of rare arthritis disease. And he was treated in a clinic for a few weeks. And he left that clinic as a dying person with only a few weeks to live. Now, Wikipedia points out that there's a citation needed here, so we don't really know who said that. They didn't cite uh -huh. that information. But it was clear, even in Sugru's book, that he had been sick. So after seeking relief for his condition in Florida, Sugru moved to Virginia Beach, which is where Casey wound up ultimately, in mm. June of 1939. And he lived at the Casey home until October 1941 with Hugh Lynn Casey, his classmate from Washington and Lee, as his nurse. He received readings from Edgar Casey on treatments for his condition. 
on file at Edgar Casey's ARE headquarters. That's an institute we'll be talking about that is still around, that houses a lot of his readings and works to keep his name alive and keep his work out there. That's in Virginia Beach. There are a total of 76 documented psychic readings given specifically for Thomas Sugru by Edgar Casey and a collection of Sugru's writings. It was during this time that Thomas wrote There is a River, the biography that we were just talking about. During his lifetime, Sugru wrote seven books, including Starling of the White House, which I thought was really interesting, sounded really interesting. This was with and for Edmund Starling, the man who protected all U.S. presidents from Woodrow Wilson to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So that's pretty cool. And he had done some work on the nation of Israel. He also wrote a uh, jazz book on uh, the famous Eddie Condon entitled We Called It Music. A Generation of Jazz, written with and about Eddie Condon. It's a formidable account of the birth of that genre, stretching from lively descriptions of Condon's life to deep philosophical interpretations. There were several other books as well, but I just I think it's important to understand the author of this book because it's considered a definitive work uh, and biography of Casey during his life that was written by someone who was actually living with Casey when he wrote right. it. And I think it's, right. it's important to know what kind of person he was and where he came from, and that this wasn't the only book he wrote that and and what his background was like i think it's interesting now there's another reason that the book got published though and it, and it wasn't just because he had impressed thomas sugru who was a journalist he also had impressed a prominent editor and when i say he i mean casey at holt reinhardt and winston named william sloan in his 2015 introduction to the book Mitch Horowitz reprints an incident that Sloan apparently relayed to Nora Ephron for a 1968 (laughs) New York Times article. This is the excerpt. It's very interesting. This is from page five of the Kindle edition of Thomas Sugru's There is a River. And this is from the point of view of Sloan, the editor for Holt, Reinhardt, and Winston. A member of my family, one of my children, had been in great and continuing pain. We'd been to all the doctors and dentists in the area, and all the tests were negative, and the pain was still there. I wrote Casey, told him my child was in pain, and would be at a certain place at such and such a time, and enclosed a check for $25. He wrote back that there was an infection in the jaw behind a particular tooth. So I took the child to the dentist and told him to pull the tooth. The dentist refused. He said his professional ethics prevented him from pulling sound teeth. Finally, I told him he would have to pull it. One tooth, more or less, didn't matter, I said. I couldn't live with the child in such pain. So he pulled the tooth, and the infection was there, and the pain went away. I was a little shook. I'm the kind of man who believes in x-rays. About this time, a member of my staff, who thought I was nuts to get involved with this, took even more precautions in writing to Casey than I did, and he sent her back facts about her own body only she could have known. So I published Sugru's book. I thought that was really interesting. So especially when you look back at the at the story about how Sugru originally, he met Casey's son, he was like, your dad's right. what? Oh yeah, I'm going to disprove this. He goes, not only gets convinced that that Casey's the real deal gets cured of like severe arthritis. And then the same thing happens with this high level editor at Holt Reinhardt and Winston with Casey telling him, Hey, your daughter's got a problem behind this tooth that they can't see. You got to pull the tooth if you wanted to get better and they do it and it works. So, but all, all, I just want to say all that being said, my last caveat there is that when you read the book, which I found very compelling, it is super clear that Sugru has a strong confirmation bias in Casey's favor. He clearly sure. was very close to him, close to his family, and believed very much in him. And that may have clouded him having an overall objective opinion. And that's what the skeptics will say. We'll talk more about the skepticisms uh, in, <laughs> right. in the next episode. But yeah, uh, and, and I'm taking that into account. But I still, I enjoyed Sugru's book. I would recommend it to anyone that is that finds this series compelling. Well, of, of course, you know, he's going to have a particular bent. He'd be kind of a jerk. After the guy cured him, yeah, <laughs> supposedly, right. and that like, well, you cured my arthritis, but I don't really have X-ray vision or psychic <laughs> abilities, so I'm gonna kind of say you didn't really do your job. Uh, you know, seeing is believing, and believing is seeing, as it's often said nowadays. 
if you know what I mean by that, right? Is that no? Uh, I have no idea. I can't follow. Okay, it. well, uh, I've never heard proof that is phrase. in the pudding. How's that? Okay, uh, that one I know. <laughs> you can't argue with success. True, uh, and uh, nothing makes an impact on you like being the receiver of something like that. It makes a, a profound impact on your life, and you could choose to ignore it. But you know what? It's going back to the sludge entity episode. If your child is in danger or sick, and you're at a point where it's like, "Well, I'm not going to try that. That sounds goofy." What's the harm in trying that out? Maybe it'll work. As long as there's not something that is going to really do some obvious damage or or Well, and that's you know, that's harm. the trick with Casey because sometimes he did prescribe things that were thought to be poisonous and people went with it anyway depending on right. their belief level, which is an exercise in faith. It's it's very interesting. It's very interesting. There is a there is a line there, and as we'll see, Casey himself really struggled with this. It's not that he's out there going like, yeah, take a, one of those things that he prescribes a lot was castor oil, which, as you know, castor can be poisonous in some forms, but he had very specific uses for it, and uh, the things he said he was conflicted about upon waking up. So that's an interesting aspect of that. Well, the official website is edgarcasey.org, uh, which we also have used to gather a lot of information for this episode, along with, like I said, the very thorough Wikipedia entry. And that website does seem to favor, as you said, Sue Guru's work as being a complete and definitive biography, quote unquote, and written with the perspective of Sue Guru, who actually lived with Casey and his family while he was interviewing them. So uh, it's available in paper, digital, and audiobook forms. As we said, the audiobook was narrated by author Mitch Horowitz. So, and again, the other popular biography is called Edgar Casey, The Sleeping Prophet, which was originally published in 1967 and written by Jess Stern. Yeah, and between those two books, they really made him internationally famous. And that's what I thought of him as even before we started looking into him. I knew him as the sleeping prophet, even having yeah. not read the books or or even heard of the book, actually. So Right. Well, it's interesting uh, during the time, pre-internet, of course, how popular he did become as word of mouth spread because some people were finding relief, so much so that... Word spread very fast as word got out and, and newspaper articles were being published. But let's back up and let's take a look at the timeline of this pretty interesting guy, this fascinating guy who's had such an impact on so many people, because his upbringing is pretty prosaic and bucolic in a lot of ways, except for some very significant, strange things that happened that had altered his life. So who was he as a young boy? Well, let's take a look at the life and times of Edgar Casey. So as you said in the intro, Edgar Casey was born on March 18th, 1877, in an unincorporated farming community at the time called Beverly, eight miles south of Hopkinsville, Kentucky, home of, yes, you said it, Scott, the alien goblin encounter of Sunday night, August 21st, 1955, at the Sutton family farmhouse in the community of Kelly. And Hopkinsville was one of the towns over which passed the last widespread total solar eclipse in the U.S. at 1.24 to 1.25 p.m. on August 21st, 2017, which was the 62nd anniversary of the Close Encounter invasion with the Sutton and Taylor families. And I suppose some wondered if Casey himself might return. Yeah. I mentioned this when Connor Randall was on talking about the Estes Method, but that was also when we coincidentally released the second part of our series on the Kelly Hopkinsville story. And we didn't plan that at all. We just wound up releasing right. it. it. It's so strange how that stuff all ties together. And mm -hmm. I, as yet, I do not see any relationship between, and I'm not implying that there's one between Casey and the <laughs> goblins. <Yeah>. But uh, <laughs> well, just, knows, just yes. to get the big picture timeline of what's interesting is that, that the Kelly Hopkinsville goblin encounter happened just 10 years after Casey passed away. So I think that's, that's yeah. yeah. So that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, numbers do seem to play a significant part in this entire story here. And uh, if you've seen Hellier, they certainly uh, make a point of that as well. But it's just odd that, yeah, the solar eclipse happened. It's over. Hopkinsville, Casey, the anniversary, goblins. It's all one big delicious bouillabaisse <laughs> of weirdness. <laughs> Well, but this is this upbringing is pretty normal here. Casey was one of six children born to farming parents, Leslie Burr Casey and Carrie Elizabeth, nay, Major Casey. 
major was her maiden name. I know what name uh, means. You telling well, me that? Well, some people out there, I didn't until we started doing this kind of research okay. <laughs> years ago. Nay. I just thought born. you were doing a, uh, yeah, I thought you were doing a horse sound. Uh, <laughs> but what was his, uh, what was his nickname, Leslie? Uh, yeah, yeah, his nickname, I know him as from Sugar's book, Squire. Yeah. Squire Casey. Oh, okay. Everyone referred to him as Squire Casey. And That's he kind was of a quite a personality. Thing, isn't it? I not that I know of. I mean, I'm from okay. the South, but I don't right. know. It may have been back then. But he's quite a character. We'll go into more detail on him later. Yes. I have a lot We're to say. We're about to get about, to him. Yeah, I have a lot to say about him. But uh okay. yes, they <laughs> referred right. to him as Squire Casey. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, Leslie was his formal Christian name here. And as I said, Edgar had a pretty normal uh, upbringing, you know, in a rural farming community in Kentucky at the time, except for a few major things. Now, as a small child, it started to run off the bat because it seems his psychic abilities started to emerge from a very young age, as he claimed he played with imaginary friends that were termed little folk. I don't know about the Fae. They didn't sound... Pixie-esque, maybe just little people. I don't know. Uh, that's what it was termed. I'm not sure who came up with that, but he played with the little folk, which he considered spirits from the other side because he said that he could see through them if he looked hard enough. That's fascinating for a, a little God, boy. Yeah, that is interesting. I mean, every kid has imaginary friends, but when you start getting real specific like that, Oh, yeah. <laughs> Especially when they start telling you to do things. That wasn't the case here. It's not It's yeah. not creepy or weird other than it's, yeah, it's he's talking to beings from the other side who apparently were nice and, and good playmates. But there was tragedy early on. Around this time, not too long after Casey was born, on February 22nd, 1880, Casey's future wife, Gertrude Evans, was born in Hopkinsville, local gal here. Seemed like an awesome woman. They seemed like a very uh, supportive couple, supported each other. She so had a little cool. trouble with what was going on from a very just pragmatic point of view because it's it's a little wild to take. But at this point... These children are very small. Yes. And we're not, tragedy... we're not to that part yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not to... no, no, we're, we're still at the beginning here. Yeah. Because at an early age, at just four years old, not only was he playing with imaginary friends that he could kind of see through, little folk, but on June 18th, 1881, he was witness to tragedy. He sees his grandfather, Thomas Jefferson Casey, get killed in a horse accident. And afterward, Edgar said he could see and talk with his late grandfather's spirit. There's a couple of things I want to point out about that. One thing that's interesting that is, I think it was his grandmother had later told him that a, a great number of the Casey kids, meaning his grandfather and siblings, yeah. had, were named for presidents. And she oh. thought, she jokingly told Edgar that she thought he had, that their parents had done that so that they could never run for president. <laughs> <laughs> so there were several Edgar. of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah she, I and see. So Thomas Jefferson Casey, there were other ones as well. But the accident is actually described in Suger's book. And it's interesting because it's not one of those super traumatic things to witness. It really was just the horse went a little crazy. It reminded me of um, the stories that you heard from Bob Gimlin on his, the little documentary that you can get oh, from yes. his website about yes. him because he used to break horses. Pretty fascinating stuff, but the horse just essentially got away and I think jumped over a fence or something and then eventually uh, fell on him or, or dumped him or something. And I, I imagine watching it was probably, I think, maybe a little anticlimactic. I mean, the way it's described in the book is, well, the horse did this and it did that and then grandpa was dead. Like it was just real simple matter of fact thing. But you can imagine as a little kid, you know, watching your grandpa and then it's like, well, that's now he's gone. That's the end of that. Yeah. Here's some other interesting details about his grandfather, though. His grandfather was a water witch, which I love this term. And we've talked about divining uh, before, but I've never heard the term water witch. He could find water for wells with a forked hazel twig in his hand, and all the locals would call him to come over. And every time they dug, he was spot on with where the wells were. He also had apparently an extremely green thumb. He could make any plant come to life and be healthy and happy. This is on page 72 in the Kindle edition of There is a River. Sugru quotes Casey's grandmother as telling Edgar, this is really fascinating. Get ready for this, Forrest. I, I don't know if you heard about this. Mm. Casey's grandfather could, quote, make tables and chairs move and brooms dance without touching them. But he never made a show of it. I don't believe anyone ever saw him do it but myself. He used to say to me, everything comes from God. Some men are more intelligent than others and can make more money. Some can sing divinely. Some can write poetry. I can make things grow. 
The Lord said there is set before each of us good and evil for us to choose. So if I spend all my time making brooms dance and doing tricks for people's entertainment, that would be choosing evil, end quote. Interesting. Yeah, so I anyway. Did, I had not heard that, no. But psychokinesis uh, he was... we're talking about here. That is a big deal. I mean, it's one thing to lay down and be like, oh, yeah, you need to eat some herbs. It's another <laughs> thing to make a broom move or a chair. That is, obviously, it's coming from grandma. There's a history of oral tradition in the South. Stories yes. get taller and taller. But still, this this it sounds like a pretty convincing anecdote when you think about it. And I also, I love the idea of people with powers. And this is something that I think about a lot of times when we encounter these stories and as we work our way through history and on, on Astonishing Legends. I always think about the people that have seen something or that have a power or an ability to do something that don't ever tell anybody. It, they just live with it. it. Because if you think about it, I, you know, I have people in my own family who are extremely introverted. And I can tell you right now that I'm very close to, one person in particular that I'm thinking of, if this person could move furniture on their own, they wouldn't tell anybody and wouldn't care if anyone ever knew. It's an interesting idea. These people that maybe have these powers and don't care about telling anybody about it, but that they're out there. Well, uh, as we've known and continue to find out, it's best people don't know because nothing... Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. if you listen to our show, things get sideways pretty quick. <laughs> well, nothing, nothing ever good comes from that because then people uh, poke you, test you, prod you. They want you to do stuff for tricks, uh, for money. And that's a little a bit what happens to Casey. But what you're describing there is Scatman Crothers and his grandmother with The Shining, that they have this ability, but only they know. And it's something special. And this is also something with Casey and his grandfather. Maybe there's something that does skip a generation. And maybe there is a familial connection to these abilities. That stuff does seem to run in families in strange ways, but not exactly the same. And his grandfather, it seems, was blessed with the talents of Enoch and that he could grow things and, and make things prosper. Well, now we come to what I would consider the first major turn in young Edgar's life, something that was so profound and would set the course of the rest of his experiences and a little bit about his belief. Because in 1884, at seven years old, Edgar starts school in Beverly. But from the start, Casey found it difficult to focus on his studies in school, and he probably suffered from a learning disability or something like dyslexia that was unknown at the time. So he was a well-minded boy, but he, he was having trouble in school. He just, he just wasn't getting stuff. But now we come to one of the most profound stories, at least for his life story. And what is that, Scott? Well, that's the story of the angel that visited Casey. Which, and when you hear the story, you'll see why I'm calling it an angel. That's the, it's the only way to describe what he says happened. Well, we said it before, one of the things about Edgar Casey was that he was a devout Christian, and he was actually so interested in the Bible, I think when he was around 12 or something, he decided that he had wanted to read it through once for each year that he had been alive, once for each year of his age. And he started later, obviously, after he's reading, so he had to cram a little bit to get caught up, but then he decided he would do that. And he... He figured out that if he read three chapters a day, Monday through Saturday, and then five chapters on Sunday, he could finish the Bible in a year, and he did that every year. Sometimes when he was doing this, he would go out into the woods to a lean-to that he had built that he had made to do the reading. He was out there one day when something happened to him. He realized a woman was suddenly standing in front of him, and he thought it was his mom but then she spoke to him in a soft voice that he said reminded him of music. And she said to him, your prayers have been heard. Tell me what you would like most of all so that I may give it to you. He noticed that she appeared to have wings, although it was hard to see her clearly. At that moment, he was thinking of Jesus and the disciples. And he said, most of all, I would like to be helpful to others and especially to children when they are sick. Ooh, good answer. Yeah. That's the, that's the well, right I mean, answer. Yeah. If an angel you asks you a see. question... I want a million dollars. No, it's, like in, dog. it's yeah. like in Ghostbusters. If someone asks you if you are God, you say yes. <laughs> no. So uh, this is kind yeah. of the opposite thing. But anyway, she apparently did not respond to his request. And in fact, she vanished without even acknowledging that she had heard him. So it's interesting. Now, uh, later, you had pointed out here as an adult, he ended up recruiting missionaries. 
right? Well, he yeah, he was very religious, uh, devoutly all through his life, and he, he said he wanted to be a missionary, and he actually ended up recruiting missionaries, and he would remain active in his church with the Disciples of Christ denomination. But here's what's interesting, you know, because of the nature of Casey's connections to what we think of today as New Agey beliefs and practices, it might surprise a lot of people to know that he continued to follow a more traditional Christian doctrine throughout his entire life, and he even ended up teaching Sunday school. But as we said in the beginning, Casey had some trouble accepting the things he was reporting while in his sleep, since uh, they conflicted with his more mainstream beliefs, and in his earlier days, he had troubling doubts as to where his psychic abilities were coming from. That is to say, directly from the form and nature of the God he believed in. Yes, and we're going to talk more about that as the series progresses, because that's a significant conundrum for him. The diametric opposition, in some cases, of some of the advice that he's giving when he's in his hypnotic state it doesn't necessarily reconcile with his Christian point of view. So that's very fascinating. Well, I want to talk a little bit more about Squire Casey or Edgar's dad. I, I can't really figure out <laughs> where Sugru was going with this in the book. There, and, and there's a fair amount, um, just to be fair, of old-fashioned and definitely politically incorrect ideas and terms in There right. is a River, but that's to be expected. The book was published almost 80 years ago. It, one thing that I personally couldn't figure out was what the real message was about Edgar Casey's dad. He he's portrayed both as non-believing when Casey was young and then conversely supportive later as it became obvious that what Casey could do was a real thing. However, well, believing is seeing, as yeah, we see. believing is seeing saw, as you just he said. He saw it happen. Yeah. Well, it, there is a section in the book though that also makes it clear that Casey's dad was physically abusive to Edgar when he was young and having a hard time with his schoolwork. To make matters worse, Edgar's teacher was his own uncle, who was, of course, reporting all of Edgar's shortcomings in class to Squire Casey. And like you said, Forrest, a few minutes ago, I, I think he may have been dyslexic or had ADD or some undiagnosed condition that made it difficult for him to absorb information at that age. Right. He he wasn't a dumb guy, to put it simply. And, and I know that you would say that uh, he described himself as such, but he was also a very modest man. And he realized his station in life and that, you know, he had a an eighth grade education, actually getting into the ninth grade. But that was adequate back then for somebody who would be in the trades or a in sales or something that was not an academic pursuit. So he became a pretty good photographer. He understood various concepts well, but there's one thing that he would tell his dad. There, there's he, he just couldn't see things the right way. To me, that's like dyslexia when you just you just don't see the words as others do. And you have to make adjustments because something he would tell his dad is, Papa, just let me sleep on it. And I'll have an answer for you. So g getting to that in a particular story that relates to that, there was this particular night that Squire Casey in, in Sugru's book is literally described as beating Edgar into the evening when he couldn't get a lesson right. And he actually hit him so hard that Edgar fell out of his chair and onto the floor. And, and for me, being a, a father of a 10-year-old myself and knowing how, how much... They, the kid wants to please you. It was really hard for me. It was extremely difficult for me to read this part of the book, and I had to put it down for a minute. But it was it was clear to me that, as I said, Edgar had uh, some sort of learning disability. And people didn't know a whole lot about that back then. But to be slapped out of a chair over and over for hours on end because he couldn't recite a lesson in his book is is really horrific. And that one incident painted Squire Casey in a particular light for me that I couldn't shake when he was mentioned later in the book as being more supportive. Now, I suspect the disciplinarian side of his sternness was more accepted back then, so maybe Sugru didn't give it a ton of attention, or maybe he felt like he had been honest and he was just relaying events, but it brought to mind something else about the onset of Casey's skills. Now, I've never been abused. I've certainly read about it, and I know people that have that have dealt with it in their lives, and it's my understanding, <laughs> as an armchair amateur, nothing of any sort, that in these situations... It's common to dissociate with what's happening around you, as well as come up with anything you can think of to get the abuse at the hands of someone who's so much more powerful than you to stop. And it led me to wonder if, in Forrest, I, I thought about you when, when I was conceiving this pure conjecture, by the way. It led me to wonder if part of the place that Edgar went to in his mind and what he did 
and this skill that he developed was partially developed out of an intense effort of self-preservation and a disconnection from reality that was already present for him. So it's almost like it might have been a perfect storm of events between what happened in his mind, both imagined and real, that helped him open that door to the Akashic Record, if it exists. Now, I, I say this because that night, according to Sugru's book, Casey heard the voice of the angel come to him in the midst of this, you know, these repeated beatings he was getting. And maybe I shouldn't call them beatings, but the book describes him as being slapped hard enough that he fell out of his chair onto the floor. The voice came to him of that same angel that he saw in the woods. And it said to him, quote, if you can sleep a little, we can help you. Sugru's book does not mention that Casey was told he should literally sleep on the book, but that's what he did. He asked his dad if he could sleep for just a few minutes, and he took the book and rested his head on it and took a short nap. And his dad had said, when I come back in, from going in the kitchen, I think, to make tea or something, when I come back in here, you better know the lesson. So when Edgar woke up after sleeping on that book for just a few minutes, he had memorized the entire book, cover to cover, page for page, image for image, down to the page numbers. He actually spelled out the word synthesis, according to Sugru, and he pointed out that the page that that word appeared on also had a picture of a silo. He had learned the book so effectively that he could answer any question about anything from anywhere in the book, including the pictures. And what did Squire Casey do? Well, he does what an abuser does. He didn't believe Edgar had known it all along. He accused him of tricking him, further abusing him verbally. But this was the beginning of something amazing for Edgar. He would go on to be able to literally sleep on books and then recite everything in them. He was learning by osmosis somehow, which, you know, we used to joke about in college. I, I remember joking about it. <laughs> I wish I could just sleep on it. And I, I feel like I was probably making reference to the, the, the folklore surrounding that Edgar Casey could do this. Now, there can be no rational explanation for this. However, he proved that he could do it over and over and over. Yeah, I tried that as a kid. <laughs> My dad was reading his books early on since I was very, very little. I remember hearing him tell that story, and I thought it was so cool. That would help so much with my schoolwork, and didn't really work for me. But I should go back to it just to see what happens. I do like taking naps, so <laughs> no harm, no foul. But yeah, I, it's just, there's no explanation for it. Like you said, it's, there's a technique called photo reading where you're you're flipping through the pages and, and you're training yourself to see the whole page at one time and, and be able to recall it. But with a book closed, like something else is going on here, if this is true, quite a feat. Here's something that's interesting about this. And I've mentioned this on the show before, I know I have, but uh, the, my first two years of college, I, I transferred in the middle of my college exploits. But the first two years of college, I went to NC State University. And during my freshman and sophomore year, I would sometimes go to the parties on frat row, uh, which I would later, always later regret. <laughs> and I was not in a fraternity, but I did have some friends that were in them. And I remember I would go to the, uh, the teak house, Tau Kappa Epsilon. And in the teak house, I remember too, that there was a guy there with a photographic memory. And I was mm -hmm. never in this house except for when there was some crazy kegger going on. So the house is filled with people and drinking. I mean, it's truly animal house. It was insanity. But the guy that was living there at the time, he had in his room several books. And you could go up there and he would do this at a party, usually drunk out of his mind. You could go up there and pick a book out of the room and then come down tell him the title and open to a page number and ask him to recite something from it. And he could every time. And I went to at least a couple of parties where he would do that. It would be a party trick, but, yeah. and you, and I'm saying, and it wasn't some friend of his that was picking it. It wasn't stage. It was right. like anyone that had come to the party could do it. He'd be like, go up to my room. And of course he was getting all A's, never had to study anything and spent most of his time <laughs> drinking beer. And, uh -huh. But he had a use. true photographic memory, and right, I wouldn't have right. believed it if I hadn't seen that. However, that yeah. dude, and he would tell you, and I can't remember his name, but I remember what he looked like. That dude would tell you that he had to look at the pages for that to happen. He wasn't, oh, right. you know, he wasn't sleeping <laughs> yeah. on the books or, right, you know, of course. So eventually, Squire Casey became such a believer in Edgar's abilities that he bragged to a congressman, and I, I, I may have said this before, I can't remember, but the Squire was very politically involved. He loved politics and was wrapped up in politics, and I think at one point even ran for some office or, or was very close with somebody who did. 
But anyway, he had told this congressman that his son could remember anything if he could just sleep on it. Well, the congressman, of course, didn't believe him, but he drafted up a speech on the taxation of quinine, <laughs> of all things, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, which I guess was being debated at the time, and said he wouldn't even let Edgar sleep on it. And Squire Casey said, fine, I'll read it to him while he is sleeping. And that's what he did. Oh, interesting. Yes, he read it to him while he was sleeping. After that, Edgar recited the full speech in front of the congressman and the squire and uh, some other folks, apparently, for 90 minutes, word for word. It took so long, people were getting bored, but the congressman's mind was blown. And <laughs> that was just from Squire Casey reading it to him in the night. So now there's a little interesting insight there into how this might work. I'm always looking for that angle, as you know, what, what, what can we tell from this? And there is something about the sleeping state, at least with Edgar Casey uh, throughout his life. It's not just meditative. There's something about sleep that has always been, well, he's the sleeping prophet, but, but, but there is something about that state for him that is extra special. And a little bit with all of us, I believe, if we are meant to tap into it. Well, here's another interesting story that happened in Casey's youth. Not long after this incident, this is perhaps the first evidence that Casey was able to diagnose medical ailments in his sleep, that special state of his. While playing a ball game at school, Edgar was struck on the base of the spine by the ball. and He began to act strangely immediately after the injury, and his parents, they put him to bed to rest and recover. Yeah, and here's, here's what's interesting. I think he was in some kind of shock or something because yeah. they... They said that he was talking strange and didn't seem to be really present, even though he had gotten up and was moving around, but right. he was a, a little bit off. There's some strange, I would guess, nerve bruising that affected his behavior. And as we've seen, that, that can happen. Usually it's more of a head injury, but something happened to him where even the strike at the base of his spine was causing him to act very strangely. And so while he slept, another strange thing happened. A treatment for his injury was revealed to him, which consisted of a poultice. There's one of our favorite words again, at least one of mine, poultice. Yes. I, also, <laughs> my wife is a comedy writer, put that word in, in many sketches when she was in Browning's <laughs> Theater. So make right, a poultice. Just, I, I remember that it was... <laughs> It just guaranteed laugh. Funny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, all it is is it's a it's a mixture of herbs or, or vegetable matter, uh, sometimes mixed with flour, but wet and compressed and applied to the skin, usually held in place with a cloth, something like that. So we, we've all heard that, and it's pretty popular folk medicine for dermal transference, perhaps, of mm. medicinal properties in through the skin. But yeah, you're sounding very technical there. I'm impressed. That is just all... Uh, dermal transference of medicinal properties. Yeah, I've been looking at this stuff all day, so <laughs> <laughs> it's just flowing out and it has no meaning at all to anyone, really, but uh, I hope it sounds good. Uh, well, this remedy seemed to work. Yeah. Which was very strange. His parents applied the prepared poultice and they pressed it to the injury while he slept. And he was cured, I think, in a day or two, really quickly. Yeah. And they had a conversation about it when he said, well, this is what you should do in that sleep state. I guess they talked about it. And his mom said, well, there's nothing in this that's dangerous or bad for him. So why don't we do right. it? Why not? Yeah. 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 It's like you said, some some uh, natural things like mustard seed or whatever, that can burn you. You can get a chemical burn for some things. And I remember mustard paste or these have mustard plaster which was, uh, you know, the hot chemical properties of mustard when you had a cold, like a chest cold, they would apply this mustard plaster to your chest and would heat up and would loosen the phlegm in your chest with a with a bad chest cold. And there was a product called... It's like Icy Hot. Yeah, this was called... Uh, there was no Icy about it. It was just yeah. all hot. But they just had a hot. product when I was a kid <laughs> called Muster Roll. And I remember being a kid and having a bad chest cold and my parents applied it and it really worked. And he, once again, his dad was proud of what his son could do. This is pretty amazing stuff. He figured it out. He apparently he had special knowledge from somewhere. Well, Edgar's father, Leslie, there's a quote attributed to him about his son in that, quote, he's the greatest fellow in the world when he's asleep. <laughs> Which means there was some recognition of his special abilities and it being connected to sleep. But it would be several years before Casey would use this talent of sleep diagnosis again. So it was a one-off incident, but apparently got his dad's attention and I'm sure his mom's as well. 
Not long after this, there's another remarkable story that seemed to impress people since uh, it seemed strange, a little bit wondrous. And this one has to do with Edgar Cayce's effect on animals. And there's a story about him riding a recalcitrant mule. I did something dumb. No, no, you didn't just start a computer update, did you? Well, if I did, you wouldn't be hearing me right now, would you? All right, good point. So what'd you do? <laughs> I uh, I bought some pants off of Instagram. Oh, you fool. You should have known better. <laughs> I know, I know. It was an impulse buy. And, of course, everything was the wrong size. Uh, you were able to just exchange them, right? Well, I thought it was going to be no big deal. You know, just I'll go to the website, fill out a form, send back the pants, and wingo, man, I'll have the right pants on their way back to me. But as soon as I found out that this company didn't have a website, I knew I was in trouble. Oh, yeah, see, that's what I've been saying. I don't care how much people think they can run a business or showcase their projects just off social media apps, you still need a website. You just never get the functionality and the legitimacy like you do with having your very own website. Boy, ain't that the truth. And it's so easy and fun to do with Squarespace. Anyone can simply and beautifully create a web presence that they own, where you own your domain. So you can sell or promote whatever you want with your own ideas and sense of style with flair and functionality. Your own domain name is also still the best way for people to remember who you are and actually find you on the web, rather than be buried behind some other companies. We've always gotten a lot of compliments on how good our Squarespace site looks. And I still tell people it's the easiest and best way for everyone to experience everything we're doing. And Squarespace has everything you need from the get-go. So you can blog or publish content, announce an upcoming event or special project, showcase your cool idea, or sell products and services of all kinds with their powerful e-commerce tools. And Squarespace's new email campaigns make you stand out in any inbox so you can build your brand and sell more by saying more. So head on over to squarespace.com legends for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code legends to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. So you in the market for some extra small Chinese pants? No, thank you. Hi, this is Sander Bergwerf from the city of Sertogenbosch. When I'm not practicing the pronunciation of my last name and the name of the city I live in, I'm listening to Astonishing Legends. Now, let's get back to the show. This is kind of a short story, so I'm just going to read it straight from Suger's book. This is from page 77 in the Kindle edition of There is a River. One day in late August, Uncle Clint sent him to plow a cornfield, him being Edgar, giving him a meal that belonged to one of the men who had been hired for the tobacco harvesting. Oh, by the way, I don't know if we mentioned that. I, I had it in my notes. But Hopkinsville at the time was world famous for dark tobacco, oh. which was used in chew, but also used in blends for pipes, for like spicing uh. up the blends. So uh, I guess that was the place, not just that place, but uh, in that right. part of Kentucky and some of Tennessee, that was where that was grown for the whole world. Hmm. So anyway, all day, Edgar is following behind the mule, guiding the plow. At one point, he stopped to mend the plow, I guess. And when he was kneeling, he suddenly became aware of a presence. And he knew who it was, though he saw nothing. And we, our listeners, I'm talking to you, you all know who this was too. It was that same angel. The voice said, leave the farm. Go to your mother. She needs you. You are her best friend. She misses you. Everything will be all right. He knew that she was gone after that, but he hesitated to look up. When he got to his feet, he grasped the plow handles and kept his eyes on the ground. When evening came, he mounted the mule and drove to the farmhouse. As he came up, the men looked at him queerly. The owner of the mule ran to him. Get down, he shouted. That mule will kill you. He got down, bewildered. She's never been ridden, the man said. Won't let anybody get on her. What happened? Edgar replied, nothing. I just got on and rode her home. One of the other men said, she's too tired to fuss. Good time to break her in. Give her a try yourself. The owner mounted the mule, and the mule threw him off. <laughs> the men looked at the boy, sick at heart. He turned and walked away. After supper, he packed his belongings and walked to town. Oh. So it's an, it's an interesting thing. It's a, it's a little bit of a, of a yeah, like you said, it's, it's the, yeah. is he the mule whisperer, or is there <laughs> what's happening well, that's here? interesting and, and, and heartwarming. That yeah. 
he was given a message that your mom misses you. She needs you. And yeah, and he was spending you, a lot of time with her and was reluctant to move away too because uh, he had several sisters and they were all younger. And she had her hands full with those girls. Yeah. So he was trying right. to help with that. I think he had four. I can't remember exactly. But uh, that was something that he wanted to stick around and help her with until they got older and he felt better about leaving. But it was clear that they were very, very close. Yeah. No, th there was a close-knit uh, aspect to the family. There was also a closeness that remained throughout their lives and a willingness on Casey's part, Edgar's part, to help out where he was needed. And that's just how it's done in farm families. Because in 1893, at the age of 16, Casey quits high school to go work on the farm of his paternal grandmother. And she passes away in August of that year. And Casey, he stopped going to school partly because of the cost to his family, but also in those days, as we said, ending up with a ninth grade education was considered plenty of schooling for people in the working class. It wasn't a big deal. Like you weren't, again, you weren't under school. Like that's about as much as you need to know for what you're going to be doing the rest of your life. And the rest of Casey's young adulthood after leaving the farm would be spent for working at whatever jobs he could find. So he was ready to help out. He was ready to go work. And that close family relationship, I think, lasted throughout their lives, even though it, it may have sounded a little abusive, uh, as we described here. The family did kind of stick together. But he continued to have a developing psychic prowess, we could say, in December of 1893, or it could be January of 1894, sources differ on this, the Casey family moved into a house at 705 West 7th Street in the town of Hopkinsville, Kentucky. So they're eight miles back now into town, and it seems like they are giving up the farming life, at least putting that aside, and now the dad is trying to make his way and his fortune in other things besides farming. Uh, it's reported around this time that this is the beginning of the development of Casey's psychic abilities. He would start to see spirits milling about, be able to speak to angelic beings, hear the voices of departed loved ones, and easily see people's auras, which is interesting. Now, uh, again, he's one of the people here, at least for the United States around the turn of the century, that helped make that a household term. I certainly heard it when I was a kid, and now this is totally unverifiable by me. So this is a story about Edgar Casey seeing auras and that apparently he was in a building that had an elevator, and the elevator doors open. He saw that there were people in it. He was about to get on, but he saw that everyone in the elevator had a black aura, and he wisely did not step on, said, I'll just take the next car. The doors closed. The cable broke or something snapped, that elevator crashed to the bottom, and everyone inside was killed. Yeah, I don't believe this one at all. <laughs> well, that's, I'd like to. Well, I'm going to tell you why. Yeah. I know, I would love right. to. It's it's an interesting story, but it's right up there yeah. with There's Room for One More, which I think we covered in Arcapalooza, maybe. Maybe that's Digest. where that came from. It's the Reader's Digest story. Right. Uh, you know, where the person went to the house and the hearse came in the driveway and there's room for one more. And then yeah, well, there's none of that happening. And the elevator snapped <laughs> and whatever. There's but no creepy guy the like same, Kurt Armister Casey. It's there's the same denouement, though. I mean, how many elevator cables are... I feel like it, I feel like we would... That, that story... Where'd you get that okay, story? Okay, for, forget all about that. I remember that as a kid. It's like, ooh, that's cool. I wish I could see people's auras. Here's what you need to know about auras. They are different colors, apparently, depending on the person's mood, their health... There are different aspects of it. And if yours is black, something, something terribly is wrong. That's the point. And that people that I know, my, you know, my grandmother with some concentration claimed that she could see auras. And a lot of the time, if you're in good health, I believe your aura is just golden, but it could be, it could be different colors. So uh, I'm not going to get into it now, but that is one thing about uh, the indigo children. You can just look that term up. They yeah. apparently have indigo colored auras. So interesting. not getting into that right now, but that's, uh, yes, it's like a mood ring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Casey was able to see it at will uh, at ease. And, and that's another interesting aspect about him is that it took very little effort. He didn't have to train. These were just natural abilities, apparently, if you believe that. Well, also happening in 1894, Casey gets a job at the Hopper Brothers Bookstore. He's going to have a couple of jobs at, at various bookstores, but it sounds like a fun job. I'd love to work at a bookstore. On March 14th, 1897, he gets engaged to his future wife, Gertrude Evans. 
And the couple would go on to be married in 1903 and go on to have three boys, Hugh Lynn Casey, Milton Porter Casey, and Edgar Evans Casey, who passed away as recently as 2013. Gertrude herself would also pass away in 1945, the same year as Edgar. In June of 1898, after losing his job at the Hopper Brothers bookstore, Casey starts work in a dry goods store. And then he gets another job in July of 1899, this time at a large bookstore in Louisville. And I put that in there because I love saying Louisville. <laughs> uh, it's, just, it's just fun to say. Uh, this time it's at J.P. Morton & Company. And that year, Casey comes home for Christmas and decides he's going to stay in Hopkinsville and, and not Louisville. So like any young man, he's just working a bunch of different jobs trying to make ends meet. Well, yeah, and what's interesting about the Morton job is that he wanted that job and he went after it and they kept saying there was no job there. So mm -hmm. he requested their entire book catalog and ah. then he slept on it. <laughs> mm -hmm. they, and so then he kept uh, writing to them, making book recommendations, and he knew to recommend books that right. weren't in the catalog because he had the catalog memorized. And finally, he got a letter <laughs> yeah. or a message from the store that said, stop sending recommendations. Um, <laughs> You're freaking us out. No, stop. Yeah, it said, stop oh. sending recommendations. You have a job. You start on this day. So nice. then he went and started working there. And um, he became, he quickly ingratiated himself. I, I think he was fairly good with people. But yes. it's interesting because in There is a River in the book, Sugru describes him as maybe feeling like these retail relationships he has are very shallow and surface, yeah. uh, but that he's good at that, but that right. maybe he also feels like they're a bit impersonal. It, I remember him describing in the book, Sugru, not, not Casey, that yeah. that seemed to count for friendship in these small towns when really it mm. wasn't friendship. It was just exchanging pleasantries in a store, but nevertheless, yeah, sales, yeah, yeah, sales, but nevertheless, there, w I guess there was a woman in the store that he made a particular impression on. And the owner of the store had told him, I have been trying to get, she's the richest woman in town. I've been trying uh -huh. to get her trade for years. She clearly loves you and is going to be back for more. So he, uh, and he gave him a raise because hmm. he was able, and she also, this woman figured out that he had memorized the entire book catalog too. She figured that out. Yeah. So it's interesting. Right. That's another story. Uh, yeah, I'd heard as a kid, but I'd, I remember it clearly at the time, though, it was happening in a, maybe it was the dry goods store, but it was like a hardware store. And he memorized everything in the catalog for sale and he impressed the guy. Maybe that was the bookstore, but. Uh, right. Yeah. But basically he had that talent and he would use it when needed and it, it impressed people. But it was kind of on the down low. Again, he wasn't doing party tricks with it. It was just something he could do, which, again, like your friend in college, that's pretty impressive to people. It makes an impact on them. Yeah, it does. Well, as I said earlier, if Edgar Casey was abused, he didn't really seem to have any ill will towards his father later in life. His father seemed to make a turnaround, believe in his son, was very proud of what he could do. And it seems that they got along, and maybe correct me if you'd read something else differently, but they seem to have gotten along uh, when they were later in life, when Casey was older, was a young adult. Yeah, they did. Yeah. Well, yeah. They, they went into business together in 1899 or 1900. Edgar enters into a business partnership with his father, Leslie Casey, to sell insurance, because his father at the time was an agent for the Woodmen of the World Insurance Company. Yes, and they came up. In a recent That's episode right. for us. Oh, That's it was right. the Velisca Axe murders. Everybody in that story, the, all the yeah. people that lived in the various houses or whatever, they were all part of that. And it's not mentioned by name in Sugru's book. It's mentioned as a, a fraternal organization. It is. This is what's interesting. It is a fraternal beneficial organization, beneficent organization, but they had their own insurance company that right. was not-for-profit, privately held, and it was uh, probably very good rates, <laughs> but it was, yeah, that's interesting. I was trying to remember where I'd heard that, and that's that's the case. Yeah. And that uh, it is, uh, I, I suppose you could maybe look at it as the like the Odd Fellows or the Elks, but, you know, so large that they have their own insurance company. And that's what Edgar Casey partnered with his father to do. He would travel around from town to town selling insurance. And in March of 1900, 
he was selling insurance as well as books and stationery from the J.P. Morton and Company booksellers. But here's another interesting turn in his life that would continue on for a while and a very fascinating story and something else that is basically a story of affliction that he struggles with. So get this, while he's out traveling from town to town selling insurance, he comes down with partial paralysis of his vocal cords, which renders him unable to speak above a whisper, something akin to a bad and lingering case of laryngitis, where sometimes he could only communicate by writing. Now, since Casey couldn't sell insurance in this condition, for almost a year, he stayed at home with his parents trying to recuperate. Later that fall, a photographer in Hopkinsville by the name of W.R. Bowles offers Casey an apprenticeship in his studio, which he accepts, thinking that photographic work wouldn't strain his voice, and he eventually becomes quite good at it, and photography becomes a big high point for Casey for the rest of his life. Obviously, he already knew that strange things happened when he would sleep with the books, but figuring out the best way to take advantage of what he could do was a little bit like stumbling in the dark. This really started to evolve when a traveling hypnotist named Hart the Laugh King came to Hopkinsville to the Opera House. Now, I had to look this guy up for two reasons. <laughs> uh, one was I wanted to test the veracity of some of the anecdotes from Segru's book because uh, I wanted to make sure that these stories all tracked, that these were real people that Casey was encountering. The other thing was, how can you not look up a guy named Hart the Laugh King? That might be the best <laughs> stage name I've heard in a while. The Laugh King. I've heard the Laugh Man as well. He billed himself as the Laugh Man. Yeah, the yeah. Laugh You're going to get a laugh. laugh. Yeah. It's, it, that's, you can that, get your money's worth. That stage name is right up there with one of my favorite thrash punk bands, also avid <laughs> listeners of the show, Hans Gruber and the Diehards. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna yeah, shout out awesome. to Kurt there and Rosie. Anyway, yes. uh, Hart the Laugh King was a traveling hypnotist of the type you think of when you think, dear God, please don't make me act like a chicken in front of all these people. <laughs> right. Now, according to Sugru's book, he had people pretend to be fish, uh, climb invisible ladders, and crochet imaginary doilies. Now, instead of calling a volunteer up, apparently he would sit and just attempt to hypnotize the entire house, the audience. Then he would go out into the audience and see who seemed like they were really under. Then he would wake up the group and bring a, quote, class onto stage of people that had all succumbed. That's pretty ingenious because uh -huh. when you don't risk bringing somebody up who can't be hypnotized, which right. there are people that can't. So he he also had some folks he traveled with for his show, including a guy that would hypnotize to go rigid and they would put rocks on his chest and smash them. He did magic as well. I guess he really was the Laugh King. So by way of confirming that this guy was a real person, listen to this ad for one of his appearances that I managed to find online. This is from the Lafayette Gazette of Lafayette, Louisiana. It was published on January 25th, 1902. Hart the Laugh King. Stanley Hart the Laugh King will give some of his popular entertainment at Falks Hall. He will appear on the 26th and 27th, 28th and 29th of January. The Adderville, Kentucky Banner has this to say of Dr. Hart. Dr. Stanley Ward Hart, a graduate in hypnotism from the New York Institute of Science. Mm, sounds official. Yes. Closed a series of four entertainments at the Opera House in this city last Saturday night. Considering the unfavorable weather, the performances were well patronized and were highly amusing and instructive. Dr. Hart is a cultured gentleman, thoroughly reliable in every particular, and made many friends during his stay in our town. One of the most remarkable feats we have ever witnessed was performed by Dr. Hart. A committee of home men addressed a note to a businessman in town, placed it in a blank envelope, and put the envelope in a lockbox in the post office amongst other mail. The key to the box was then secreted under a roll of carpet at Rayburn and Smith's store, and a route was determined by committee to be followed by Dr. Hart. When all was in readiness, Dr. Hart took Marshal S.T. Benson, one of the committee, by the hand, and blindfolded, he started from McGee Brothers and Companies, went direct to the key, traversed the route to the post office, unlocked the box, selected the envelope, and delivered it to George D. Creger, to whom it was addressed on the inside. That's from the Lafayette Pretty good trick. Yes, yeah. it's a pretty good trick. That's right up there with the <laughs> David Blaine and the cards. It is. Yeah, yeah, stuck on the ceiling or whatever. It's pretty, but obviously... There's a trick there somewhere that's been around a long time. Right. And, well, and that's magic. It's a little that's different magic. than the yeah. hypnotism. That's yeah, different. Hypnotism He's got a lot trick. going on. Here is an entirely politically incorrect listing <laughs> oh, of no. some of the special features, in quotes, in another ad that I found. And this is pretty exciting. I fully clicked on this ad uh, from an image search before I realized it was actually from Hopkinsville. 
Now, we don't know the date that Casey crossed paths with Hart, and perhaps the ARE does, the organization that is, is mm-hmm. still around. But this particular ad is from December 1st, 1899, on page 8 of the Hopkinsville Kentuckian. And this is what it says. Uh, Holland's Opera House, we know that that's where he saw him. Three nights commencing December 4th, Hart the Laugh King, the leading hypnotist of the world. Complete change of program, everything new. And here come the special features. Uh, Please remember this was written quite some time ago. The special features are trouble in a Chinese laundry, fun in a photograph gallery, farmer hayseed and wife at a circus, awkward squad in the Philippines, baseball game, students serenade, cakewalk, and a hundred new and laughable scenes. Uh, The prices to attend the show, 15, 25, 35, or I guess if you want to sit right up front, 50 cents. So, yeah. Reasonable. It's pretty reasonable. It's a, uh, it, they, they're transferable to the time. But this, they, the, the, the thing that's interesting about this particular ad is this could be the actual date that Casey and Hart intersected, but it's also clear right. Hart was in town quite a bit. Now, Casey yeah. would have been uh, 22 in 1899, just uh-huh. so, uh, again, it could work out. So Hart had heard that Casey was having the chronic problem with the hoarseness that you talked about in his voice, and he said he could cure it. For $200. Now, this part of the story freaks me mm. out because that is a mind-boggling amount of money for back then. That's like six yeah. grand, and they don't uh-huh. mention how that got paid for in the book. Uh, in Super yeah, there's book. no Medicaid. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a lot of money. I'm not sure. Although it could have been maybe from Casey's friend, Dr. Brown, or uh, Squire Casey maybe had more money than I thought he did, but I didn't think the family right. was doing that well. But anyway, what Hart found was that even though he could easily hypnotize Casey, Casey would not accept the post's suggestion. That would be the step where Hart would convince him that he was not hoarse and could recover that that post suggestion. So they noted that he spoke fine, however, when he was under hypnosis. His voice returned to normal. However, as soon as he came out from under, he was hoarse again. Hart could not get him past that second stage to the third stage. He tried several times, and word started to get out locally, and he wanted to save face, but he simply couldn't get it, and he had to accept that he wasn't going to be able to do it. He had to get back on the road to go do more shows. After this, a noted New York hypnotist, and hypnotism was all the rage at this point. Mesmer was around, and uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute, but um, this, this doctor in New York who was a top-flight hypnotist who has Again, this is this is probably better than the Laugh King. His name was Doctor Quackenboss. <laughs> yeah, because you want the first part of your surname to be Quack when you're yeah, you're in a question, right. already Dr. questionable medical practice by many. Yeah. Yes, but I love the name. Yeah. You, you can't um, beat Quackenboss. But he, I guess, he heard about what had been going on with Hart and Casey, and he came to Hopkinsville to personally try and hypnotize Casey. He put him in what he called a very, very deep sleep, but it worked too well. Edgar Mm -hmm. was asleep for 24 hours and no one could wake him up. People were getting scared, Uh, but eventually he did wake up. It took him a few days to get back to normal sleep after that, but he recovered. So enter this new guy. Uh, but he's not new, really, not to the Casey's anyway, Al C. Lane. He was friends with the Casey family, and he had been studying osteopathy by correspondence, and he wanted to try and help Edgar. Edgar's sister, one of his sisters, worked with Lane's wife at a millinery that he and his wife owned. Now, this guy was an unlikely man to succeed at helping Casey out. He was frail, he was in poor health, but he was anxious to give it a shot. He was apparently very excited about the osteopathy. So for this experiment, Edgar finally suggested that he put himself to sleep rather than uh, Hart trying to do it or Quackenboss <laughs> trying to do it, Dr. Quackenboss. Yeah. I'm sorry. I went to... uh, but it always <laughs> seemed to work better, Casey was figuring this out, when he did it himself. So he put himself under, uh, he called that auto-hypnosis. And once he was under, he said, the now infamous Casey line, one of my favorite lines in the book, this is right up there with, I'll see you in time. The phrase that every reading started with, yes, we can see the body. We, yes, we can see the body. What, yeah, what I want to I want to describe that a uh, little bit later here in the in the outline. Uh, that's something very significant about that. Yeah. Uh, he also would start off a reading with, we have the body. We have the body, yes. We have connected 
I, yeah, I don't want. I don't want to jump ahead yeah, here. I, we'll, I won't we'll talk get about into that it. In a bit. So, yeah, okay. Um, according to page one hundred and twenty-four of the Kindle edition of "There Is a River," at that point, Lane yelled, "Take it down!" to Squire Casey, meaning write down what Edgar is saying or about to say. Now, if this isn't a movie moment, I don't know what is. As far as I know, the story hasn't been fictionalized. I know that people listen to our show that are in the business, however. And if I were you, I would option this in short order. I would cast Joaquin <laughs> Phoenix or possibly. Andrew Scott from Sherlock. He played uh, Moriarty Ooh. on the new Sherlock. Yeah, I think he'd be really yeah. good in this role. Anyway, I digress. Yeah. So, he's also in Fleabag. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. He is. He's, he's amazing. Yeah. I love that guy. Uh, Casey, the sleeping prophet, went on to say, and I'm quoting again from page 124 of the Kindle edition, There is a River, quote, in the normal state, and he's referring to himself here. This is what's interesting. In the normal state, this body is unable to speak due to a partial paralysis of the inferior muscles of the vocal cords produced by nerve strain. This is a psychological condition producing a physical effect. This may be removed by increasing the circulation to the affected parts by suggestion while in this unconscious condition. The circulation to the affected parts will now increase, Lane said, following the instructions, and the condition will be removed. Edgar was silent. They watched his throat. The squire leaned over and further loosened his son's shirt. Gradually, the upper part of the chest, then the throat, turned pink. The pink deepened to rose. The rose became a violent red. 10, 15, 20 minutes passed. Edgar cleared his throat again. It is all right now, he said. The condition is removed. Make the suggestion that the circulation return to normal and that after that, the body awaken. Lane then diligently says, the circulation will return to normal. The body will then awaken. They watched while the red faded back through rose to pink. The skin resumed its normal color. Edgar wakened, sat up, and reached for his handkerchief. He coughed and spat blood. Ooh. Hello, he said tentatively. And then he grinned. Hey, I can talk. I'm all right. His mother wept. His father seized his hand and shook it again and again. Good boy, good boy, good boy, he said. Now, I know I'm supposed to be excited about that, but it's the same guy that slapped him out of his chair. But, <laughs> oh, so, geez, but anyway. Can't, can't, get, can't get over that, can I can't. No, I cannot get over that. I but know. anyway, All this right. is a, uh, from pages 124 and 125 <laughs> in the Kindle, uh, the Penguin Publishing Group Kindle edition of yeah. There is a River. So as, as far as I understand from the book, that was the beginning. It was the framework for how they would conduct readings in the future where uh, Casey would put himself under... And then a person would sit and follow the instructions, and, and they would write down what happened during the readings. Because th those right. notes, which you have to think about with that particular reading, that was uh, Squire Casey writing down what his son was saying while he was under yeah. there. And here again, it's just fascinating. It's a third-person diagnosis. So, so a couple of things that are interesting about what happened to him is that, one, it sounded like a psychosomatic illness or or a nervous condition that was diagnosed properly and witnessed by other people there, several people at the time. And if you could do that on your own, make your face and throat and chest flush bright red on your own, well, that's quite a party trick in itself. But it was witnessed by people. So one thing that I find interesting is that there is a connection between the physical body and the various states of consciousness and super consciousness, perhaps, if you know what I'm getting at. It could probably be best described here as a statement, and perhaps there's some truth to this statement, first thought to be adapted from a question posed by motivational author and speaker Wayne Dyer. And the statement goes, you are not a human being having a spiritual experience. You are a spiritual being having a human experience. Ooh, I love that. That's it's cool. Good. I've never heard it, that. Yeah, I really like that. The, <laughs> well, uh, I think That's the story great. goes, or at least a, a quote investigator uh, says that uh, he was asked by Volkswagen to write a letter to future generations, and he, he just asked them something like that. What would you rather be, one or the other, a human being or a spiritual experience having one or the other? So the idea here that I'm getting at is that there is a mind-body connection, and part of this healing process is tapping into that. But it may be the mind that resides outside of the body. Now we're getting back to the astral self, terms like that, metaphysical concepts like that, where your actual soul or whatever is guiding you 
has a control center that's just outside of you, that's kind of steering you around. Now, your, your everyday consciousness, that's the pilot of the ship. I've used this analogy before. That's the pilot of the ship. The actual captain is your astral self, and that is guiding you, but from a higher spiritual plane. I love like it. All new agey and spiritual about it. Yes, and this but, is when, I, again, I get to say again <laughs> my theory about angels uh, driving trucks. Or right. Nothing, but like the, <laughs> right. Somebody, I'm stealing that from someone, but the idea. Of course. Of, yeah. Well, I, the body this is, is the truck it, there, in case anybody. Yeah, didn't it, well, get it. no, yeah, the, the, right. The sh there's a ship analogy, there's a, a truck analogy, but basically, you are a vessel. You're a meat bag being driven by something higher than yourself. You just don't realize it, and if you could meat listen bag. to it, tap into it, you'd live a lot better life. A lot of people don't even listen to their own common sense, and look where they are now, living lives of misery. Yeah, if you want to be a happy housing. meat bag, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> A happy, healthy meat bag. Uh, there are things you could do, but you don't listen to your own good common sense. Now, what's interesting here, though, in this in this method of healing that we'll see Casey developing over the next couple of decades, uh, he is tapping into something that recognizes and diagnoses his condition, gets the body to heal itself, and especially for this what appears to be a, a nervous or psychosomatic condition. So uh, that's fascinating. We'll, we're going to explore that later in different uh, in different aspects. But it, it's it wasn't like he had a tumor or something. He was causing his own condition out of nervousness yeah. and probably what he was doing. He was a, maybe a shy guy, who, whatever was going on. We often limit ourselves and we don't even know it. Now, that, again, ties back to the Wayne Dyer thing is that you are just a body, but there are things that are controlling it that are outside your purview or your jurisdiction, but can be influenced and tapped into. Another interesting point, though, is that it didn't totally cure it. And I, right. that's we're going to talk about that in, in the, the debunking and skeptical section here, and that people, they want it to work first and fast and always. It must work every time. And here, it didn't work like that. It, the condition came back. Now, Al Lane was able to work with him over the years repeatedly, and eventually it did go away, so the treatment was eventually effective, but whatever was causing it by Casey, uh, whatever psychosomatic condition or nervousness or, or self-internalized mechanism that was causing him to seize up didn't totally go away. So it, it helped, but not completely 100% at the beginning. It took a lot of work. But the other thing that I noted about that was that it also required that Casey had to lean on Lane for a long time because Lane was yeah. the only one that would talk him out of the condition during a reading. Yeah, yeah, that's another interesting fact. I don't know if it was him or... It's a little, <clears throat> you know, and I'm not questioning Lane at all. I'm just saying it, but there, there clearly was a, a relationship there that had to continue in order for that to right. work, which meant that Lane would need to be around Casey and... That's something we're going to touch on more. Uh, again, I'm not saying anything about Lane, but there were sure. other folks involved with Casey that were definitely opportunistic and maybe taking oh, yes. advantage of his situation. So We're going to talk about one of them coming up. But another thing, getting back to the concept of natural remedies, I would call them, very, and very generally, and that I noticed with myself, the effects are mild. It's not like taking pharmaceuticals where, bang, you take something and, uh, you know, you're out. You're, you're so groggy, you're loopy. Uh, it may work, but there's a big, heavy chemical effect that takes its toll. Usually with me, in any case, uh, natural remedies do seem to have some effect, but they're mild. And it, it takes repetition with those. So I'm wondering if that ties in with this holistic approach in that it's not like taking a couple of fentanyl and then you're out for... 24 hours, but it's, some of this had some effect on Casey that was that powerful. Anyway, it's just interesting to me that this process had to be repeated for some reason, but it also, on the other hand, had a tremendous physical impact on him immediately. Now, here's another thing that I want to talk about earlier. Remember, I said I didn't want to get into it right then, but there's also another interesting clue as to how this might work on a metaphysical level or what Casey may have been communicating with. <laughs> While under hypnosis, Casey would refer to himself, as you said, not as the first person singular I, but he would say we, instead of calling the person for whom the reading was going to be given to, uh, calling them by their name, or saying this patient or this person, he called them the entity. And you said earlier, Scott, you didn't really come across that in, in the book? No, but I confess that at the end of the book, there were sample readings 
like a oh, good full yes. chapters, like the oh, worth, okay. That's where they pop up. Yes. They they probably pop up there, and because I didn't, I only read a few of those because it was full cases where it was like the prescriptions and all of that, and I didn't read all of them because I was desperately trying to finish the book and it was two in the morning, so I skipped through those, <laughs> right. and I might have yeah. missed the word entity in there. So okay, so I have yeah. I've read over the years some of the actual texts, and we're going to get to one passage here where you'll you'll actually hear the words that are spoken by Casey during these trances. And it's it's a little bit of odd speech, but there is some odd terminology here. And I guess pronouns, you would say. We're all big on pronouns nowadays. But to term yourself as not I, like I, Casey, can now see the person we're speaking with, which is weird to call them the entity, but to say we. Who is this we? Yeah. What is this collective of forces that are operating through Casey? Much like if you remember, the angel at the beginning said, if you sleep on it, maybe we can help you or yeah. we will try to help you. So yeah. there is a collected effort. It's not just one force or one being. So that's interesting. Uh, the other thing is, again, the entity, referring to people as the entity, not by their name and not by their body. Like, oh, yes, the, the skinny guy over in Western Kentucky I'm working on that person right now. It's it's not really viewed as a person. So again, later on, when Casey would give readings for other people, it seemed like Casey, under his own hypnotic sleep-like state, would need to make a connection not directly to the physical body or consciousness of the person at first, but to the entity of the person, like their soul, or what's nowadays described, as I said, the astral self of a person, which some claim is like the superconscious overriding aspect of oneself. And as we just discussed, the astral self, yes, that is the captain of your ship and your body and your conscious everyday functioning mind that just handles the everyday boring stuff. And then to wrap up my thoughts, it's that statement again, we have the body, we have made this connection, not so much to the physical body somewhere in the United States or around the world, because he was getting letters from people all over the world at some point, And he said that he was just as effective by reading a letter with the person's name and location, and he didn't want to know anything personal about them. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't trying to do a cold read. That's all he needed. So he was able to diagnose them over long distances and by making some kind of connection to this person's spirit. You still working out? Uh, yeah, trying to. Getting to the gym a few times a week, actually, which is good. I also decided to start making my own smoothies for breakfast, which mm. has been a healthy and tasty, easy lifestyle change. Nice. Folks, if you're exercising and eating right, you feel good because you know you're doing all the right things for your health, and that's a great feeling. But are you also planning for the what-ifs of tomorrow? Because if you're not, then it's time you do. It turns out health-conscious folks actually overpay and subsidize those who are less health-conscious. And that's not some kind of conspiracy. It's just how life insurance works. Introducing Health IQ. Health IQ uses science and data to secure lower rates for people like you on their life insurance. If you're a runner or a cyclist, or you're into CrossFit or another type of athletics, or even a committed weekend warrior, if you're vegetarian or vegan, then you deserve to be rewarded for your hard work with more affordable life insurance rates. Health IQ can save you up to 41% because physically active people have significantly lower risks for heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. And Health IQ is not just a lead generator. They take the customer through the entire process of applying, and the policy is underwritten by one of their top insurance partners. But these savings are exclusive to Health IQ. You won't find them anywhere else, and you must qualify to get a special rate. To see if you qualify, go to healthiq.com slash legends to take the proprietary Health IQ quiz. Depending upon your score, as well as other related qualifying factors, you can save up to 41% on your life insurance premiums compared to other providers. Again, that's healthiq.com slash legends to let them know we sent you and start the process with the Health IQ quiz. There's no commitment and you'll learn even more about potential opportunities to be rewarded for your commitment to living healthy. One more time, that's healthiq.com slash legends. Guess what I just got? What? A new fiend! 
<laughs> so you're still playing Best Fiends? Yeah, like a lot. I'm getting pretty good at it, too. I, I just got a Slugmageddon earlier today. Bet you don't have a bunch of those, do you? Uh, everybody gets those, actually, oh. uh, Grasshopper. But uh, uh, <laughs> oh, Wait, what's the Grasshopper? <laughs> well, he's the character from the Kung Fu TV show, but he's also, uh, I, I think one of the characters actually looks like a Grasshopper. He's oh. Salamander looking, yeah. Oh, yeah, no, I got that guy, too. Well, I, I yeah. you know what? I thought That's what I thought. I thought it was another fiend in the game. You're so far ahead of me in there. Oh, I, I guess. Well, it is a fun game, and, you know, I like playing because it does that tricky thing of keeping my mind occupied with puzzles, but also giving me an escape from my responsibilities. Hey, everybody needs to take a break now and then, and I know this is weird, but I actually really dig the music, too. Yeah. Good game music really gets stuck in your head, and, and Best Fiends has a nice soothing vibe. It's kind of like uh, when you walk into the big casino when you first get to Vegas and you hear all the slot machines, the, the music. <laughs> right. You can't describe yeah. that, but that's, you know, when I'm playing the game, that's what it feels like. It's a nice No, feeling. it's very well produced from the graphics and the colors and all that, and and, and you're right about the music. It's uh, it's like a movie. Uh, well, folks, if you haven't tried it yet, Best Fiends is not only a fun puzzle game to play with great music, but it's great to look at, too. It's really unlike any other puzzle game out there, and they update the game monthly with new levels and events, so it never gets old. I actually got so caught up in it the other day when I was getting new tires, I sat in the waiting room at the tire shop for 10 minutes playing after my car was finished. <laughs> that's that's a perfect time to play. Well, Scott here is still a noob compared to me, but the more you play, the more characters you collect. And then you get to start strategizing which ones you want to use to get past each level. Engage your brain with fun puzzles and collect tons of cute characters. Uh, trust me, with over 100 million downloads, this five-star rated mobile puzzle game is a must-play. Download Best Fiends free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Hello, I'm Kaya from Adelaide, Australia. And when I'm not chasing shadow people or trying to find the truth out about the Summerton Man, I'm listening to Astonishing Legends. Well, the, the other thing that's interesting about that is how impersonal the term body is. We have the body. Right. And, and I think that that's neat because it's not necessarily dismissive or derogatory. It's more like we have your meat sock. And we're going <laughs> to see bag, what's wrong yes. with your meat bag. Right. And we're going to fix it for you. But, you know, don't worry about it too much because it's just your meat bag. <laughs> well, yeah, well, that's the thing. We're all uh, we're all dust in the wind here. We're all ephemeral, the uh, ashes to ashes, and all that. And what's important though is the spirit that that never dies and is communing with something that's higher and uh, more delightful. But yeah, we have to suffer through this uh, this mortal coil before we get back to that, back to the source. That's another aspect of Casey's learning and and what he's teaching us later on. Well, this experience turns out to be very transformative, not only for Edgar Casey, but also for Al Lane. It was Lane who urged Casey to start giving these trans-induced readings to other patients. Lane was familiar with the hypnotic treatment work of the Marquis de Puisigar. Did I say that right? Yeah, you did, actually. I mean, I only know it's that because we just ballpark. listened to it 50,000 times on <laughs> Forvo.com. The, but. Yeah, we're in the French ballpark. Yeah, Puisigar. Marquis de Puisega. Marquis de... Well, you don't have to get a feet with it, you know. Marquis de... <laughs> Marquis de Puis... Marquis de Puisega. There we go. Okay. There you go. Definitively. No one <laughs> but, can like, ever say Nicaragua like Geraldo Rivera, though. I'll tell you that. That's, no. It's just amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't... Uh, I, I wouldn't question him about that in the first place. Um, anyway, well, it was this Marquis de Puisega who was an associate of... Franz Mesmer. You've heard of him, right? Yes. And, and yeah. just briefly, I'll talk about Puisigur a little bit. His uh, real name is Armand Marie Jacques de Chastenay, or Chastenay. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a French magnetizer, uh, to your point, aristocrat <laughs> from one of the most illustrious families of the French nobility. This is from Wikipedia. He's now remembered as one of the pre scientific founders of hypnotism, which oh. was a branch of animal magnetism or mesmerism, which he learned about from his brother, Antoine Hyacinth, the Count of Chastenay. Okay, uh, that does me, sound a feat. Forgive okay. me, French people. Uh, one <laughs> of his first and most important, and Canadians, one of his first and most important patients was Victor Race, a 23-year-old peasant in the employ of the Puisigo family. Race was easily magnetized, in quotes, by Puisigo, but displayed a strange form of sleeping trance not before seen in the early history of mesmerism. And Puisigur noted the similarity between the sleeping trance and natural sleepwalking or somnambulism, which we mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. and named it artificial somnambulism. 
Today, we know similar states by the name hypnosis, although that term was invented much later by James Braid in 1842. So well, that's um, good to know. Yeah, yeah. if you want to read more about him, we have a link to his Wikipedia page in the show notes. But that's just a little bit of background on the Marquis de Puisigue. Yeah. Well, Franz Mesmer, that you know, that's where we get the term mesmerism, as yes. we just said. And it's not it, it's a little complicated how we come from mesmerism and magnetism and animal magnetism and uh, Marquis de Puisigue are. Uh, leading to the practice of hypnotism, but you could see the line of thought and, and thinking and practice in that they tripped onto something that was very mysterious to them back then, as you can imagine. Yeah. And still is. A lot of people don't like it. <laughs> we talked to some people who are in the UFO studies field, and they don't trust it, or they do trust it when it comes to recall of memories, because people think that you can plant false memories into people's minds. And then in that case, it would be false abduction stories, and it's not very trustworthy. But what I would say is that there is something to it and that it has definitely some effect. And a lot of that is very mysterious, but worth studying, I think. And it's worth checking out. Did you, are you familiar with the search for Bridie Murphy? No, I'm not. It was something that I had heard of, before, but that's it. I just knew the name. I'd heard the name Bridie Murphy, but I didn't know anything about this. And this was a case that happened in 1952. I looked it up while we were researching this mm -hmm. show. And this was a story of a woman named uh, Virginia Teague, T-I-G-H-E. Um, mm -hmm. And at the time that this story came out, she had a pseudonym uh, for Ruth Simmons, but she lived in Colorado. And the story was that she was hypnotized and had all of these really specific memories that she had uh, lived a prior life in Cork, Ireland, and she was a little girl named Bridie Murphy, and when she was born and when she died and what her family's names were and where the house was and all this kind of stuff. And then there was a film where I think documentary style film, I haven't seen it, so I'm, I'm talking out of school here a little mm -hmm. bit, but where they went looking to confirm all the facts that she had brought up under this state of hypnosis, and they couldn't find anything. They found one house that sort of matched what she said, but the house yeah. that she described was basically every house in Cork anyway. So the the idea there uh, undermined the idea of, of regressive hypnotism and, and right. repressed memories and that sort of thing. And that was one of the first things that really, it's, it's something that skeptics point to as you know, hard evidence that these really distinct memories can come out that aren't necessarily verifiable or true, um, well, in, at least in, in our reality. I mean, you and I could yeah. go on for days about, well, maybe it's a different reality, <laughs> you know, because we conveniently just change course yeah. when we don't believe, when we want to prove that something's real that's been disproven. <laughs> but uh, acknowledging that, I think it's interesting because there, you know, this all gets connected and, and in different points of time, obviously that was mm -hmm. 1952 and Mesmer predates this, but where th things lost... Uh, a little bit of their gravitas because people were like, well, I don't know. How about Bridie Murphy? That it was more in the zeitgeist yeah. back in the in in that time period in the fifties, anyway. So just something, just well, an aside, I wanted to point out. Right, I, I would say that you can't throw that all out. As <laughs> Casey faced the same kind of criticism himself and afterwards with his critics, in that they would say, well, he's not totally accurate. Right. Uh, there is a figure. I think it's in our notes somewhere. We'll get to where. Hugh Lynn Casey, they did a rough calculation of what came true with his predictions and, and his uh, assessments and diagnoses, and they claim an above an 80% accuracy with him. That remains to be seen, I think, with a lot of the scientific community, because it, my point being is that it's really hard to track this stuff. Yeah. It's not a concrete kind of thing where you can say, well, there you go. They got one thing wrong, therefore throw it all out, which is the tendency of a lot of uh, people who are critical of stuff, and I don't blame them for that. People want 100% accuracy, I think, as a part of human nature before they're going to give it any credibility or authority, or as people like to say nowadays, agency, and that they want to see results repeatable all the time in exacting conditions. And I don't think this is an area, as everything that we're studying, you can expect from this. And I know that's very frustrating for a lot of people. Like, as I said before, Casey got a lot of criticism in that some of the readings he gave weren't accurate, as we'll, uh, we're going to cover this in part two, where they, I, I think, I don't know if they were trying to trip him up, but they had him give readings for people who had been deceased. Yeah. And there's, well, there you go. He just gave a reading for a dead person who's not around and they don't have any affliction other than that they're dead. 
but we don't know what they had in life that he may be looking at or where they are when he was reading them in the hereafter. You know, sure. There's all these things that you can't count into this equation, which a lot of people want a solid equation. That's my point. But at least with Al Lane, he thought there was something to it. And yes, he's, he's a hypnotist himself. He's, as you mentioned earlier, he may have had some motive in that this connected him to Casey and something otherworldly that he was looking for and believed in, but he he thought it was effective, and he thought it was a form of clairvoyance in that it was not just some weird fluke or it's part of Edgar Casey's subconscious that he was hearing, that somehow he was seeing, as you said, clear sight with clairvoyance. He was seeing beyond himself and his physical body. And it was Al Lane who urged Casey to start offering his readings as a public service because he believed in it. But Casey was hesitant because he was not knowledgeable about anything he was actually prescribing during his sessions and whether it could be harmful to the patient. That's where we do see a little bit of Casey's own ethics coming in. He was very reticent about giving the stuff out. He didn't want to harm anybody. He wasn't, he never proclaimed himself as this great healer. He just had this ability that he thought could be useful and he wanted to help people since he was a little kid. So hopefully we'll paint this picture of him as we go along that he did have a lot of struggle with this if this was moral, this was ethical in a medical sense. But Casey eventually and reluctantly agreed to start giving readings to the public, first to Lane's patients, his own uh, hypnosis patients, but only if the readings would be free to everybody. That's another thing. He didn't want to charge for this. Uh, at first anyway, because he was able to work and also do these readings on the side. So he wasn't into making a, a lot of money off of this at first. And then even later, he just wanted to do it because it was taking up so much of his time to pay for the expenses. So Casey started working with Lane to give more free readings to the people of Hopkinsville. And this led to local newspaper reports about their work, which led to letters coming in for help. And concerning the letters, as we just mentioned, that I find fascinating, he claimed Casey only needed the person's name he was diagnosing. Uh, at first, he had people in the room with him, and then he learned that he didn't need to have them right there next to him. He just needed their name and their location, and the cure apparently was just as effective. So once again, there seems to be power in a name. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a super good point. I, I love that point. And then also uh, there, and this just keeps happening, not only with this Casey scenario, and and we're not planning this. <laughs> I wish, yeah. I I I should stop. I wish we were planning something. I know. I, I should would, stop admitting how <laughs> we're happening into all the parallels between yeah. the episodes mm -hmm. and everything. But when you look at this and you go back again and you look at uh, controlled remote viewing and remote viewing, there's so many yeah. parallels here between what Casey was doing and remote viewing. I'd actually be curious to hear what a remote viewer, a professional remote viewer like Lori Williams, would think of him. And then again, also going back to what Connor was describing with the Estes method and some of that process, there's a lot of parallels between all this stuff, which does make you think, because they're, they're different processes, but they have a Venn diagram that intersects. And in that center somewhere, it tends to make you think that there is some kind of there there, because yeah. there's a common ground between all these different approaches that in some cases are having different goals, but they're getting to their results via the same methodology. I think that's really fascinating. Grand, yeah, un grand so unified theory stuff, you know? <laughs> the, uh, the paranormal. Yeah, the, what was it? The gut, the gut pee? The gut pee. <laughs> yeah. Grand unified yeah, the theory of the paranormal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but one thing you just mentioned that made me think of the another connection to how controlled remote viewing is apparently uh, accessed and, and practiced is that the remote viewer also does not want a bunch of detail given to them because that will taint their right. perceptions, perhaps. So That's exactly what with, I was thinking about. And of course, I should have said it. I didn't say it. So I'm glad you said it. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, with Casey, I, part of it with Casey, though, is that he wasn't a busybody. He didn't want to know people's backstory because I've, I have read some of the letters that people have sent him. And, you know, when people, it's like a, an advice thing. They want to tell you all all this uh, backstory and what's going on with them. It's, a, it's partly a piece of venting for them, which I understand. And... He didn't want to pry, really, it sounds like, into these people's lives. He's like, it's not it's not relevant. I don't need to know a bunch of personal details because, of course, with medical stuff, as we know, when you're standing in the line at the pharmacy, you don't really want to start explaining to the whole grocery store or wherever you're at what your problem is because medical stuff can be very personal. So he just wanted to know their name and their location and stuff would come to him. And 
you could tell, I think, from his perspective there or whatever was speaking through him that whatever relevant information the person needed to know, that's what was coming through and only that. And sometimes it would be, oh, by the way, you were this person three lifetimes ago. And that's what started to freak people out. And another person that was a little freaked out by all this was Casey's fiance, Gertrude Evans. Because Casey was himself worried about giving out suggested remedies while essentially being asleep. And Gertrude was unsure of this practice, to say the least. As many people at the time were under the opinion that hypnotism could lead to insanity or ill health overall. And there's one quote, and I'm not sure who said this, but it's in quotations. You can find it, I think, in the, in the book. But it's also on the wiki entry for Edgar Casey quote one dead patient was all he needed to become a murderer yeah and you know that's a <laughs> you theme gotta be careful that, yeah that theme comes up a lot in Sugru's book mm -hmm. and I think it was something that really weighed on him it scared him it scared him this, yeah. you know the idea of giving out this medical advice that he couldn't even remember what he was saying when he woke up it's like his worst nightmare would be to go to sleep wake up he doesn't even know what happened and then the next day somebody dies from something he said while he was in a trance or, or excuse <laughs> you're me, still I'm responsible to use the word trance yeah <laughs> right, but right. yeah he's still responsible for it it's interesting because there there was and i think we should talk about this more in part two there was at one mm -hmm. point a prosecution of him mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. being a fortune teller um <laughs> so and it's interesting the outcome yeah. of that case no they agreed to help people because again he's into helping people but on the other hand ironically they were trying to keep it quiet. They didn't really want to publicize this and, and do a whole uh, circus bandwagon snake oil thing where they're they're marching through town announcing this stuff because, again, it's not a huge moneymaker for them. Not that that matters, but they were not trying to publicize it and, and draw undue attention. So as quiet as they tried to keep the practice, though, word eventually got out that it seemed to be effective. People were being cured of their ailments. And whether that's the placebo effect or whatever it was, people like results. So they were sending in letters, asking for treatments, and that started coming in from all around the world. Yeah. And what's interesting about that, when you mentioned whether or not it was a placebo effect, and it's the constant placebo question for me, if a placebo works, why wouldn't you try it if everything else had failed anyway? But in, and in addition to that, I'll point out Again, with the way that Wikipedia works, a lot of the entries related to this particular story, we already mentioned that they all, they they say part of a paranormal series, and then they also prominently say, and they make sure it's real big, pseudoscience, and then the other thing they say <laughs> is placebo. Yeah. They've got it yes. all there. They're just like really tearing it down, um, yeah. which I understand if you're going to be an encyclopedia of a type that you're, you're trying to classify everything, but... Well, imagine the letters they'll get from people who don't buy into any of this. And, yes. And you know, that's their opinion. But one kind of interesting bent, specifically involving Wikipedia, we rely on them a lot and we love them, Wikipedia, that is. Yes. And we support them financially, by the way. Yes, we do. We, we yeah, donate We, we do yeah. uh, for, for the help they give us. But in the documentary Third Eye Spies, it was the story of Russell Targ, who is a serious physicist who had a lot of trouble with Wikipedia just labeling him as a basically a quack. And this guy had serious work done before his venture into remote viewing with lasers, but they don't mention that. So Right, which he, he talks about them. very comically, actually. He's like, Yeah. He's like, I worked with lasers for like 25 years. They don't mention <laughs> all they say is that I <laughs> is that I'm a yes. remote viewer. Yeah. Yeah, pseudoscience. Yeah. And exactly. he had to get a Nobel laureate to weigh in for him and to eventually get that included, but they were reluctant because they paint you all with the same broad brush. And well, yes, it, and it's it's like go. they say in Hollywood: you're only as good as your last show. You, you know, you're you're only as good as your last movie or your last thing that you wrote. And yeah, the, you know, when you write the next one and it's great, great. But if the last one you did stinks, then you stunk forever, no matter what you did before it. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ex well, exactly. That that's what you're known as. And what we're going to talk about right now is Casey moving away and getting a little bit of that undue attention or that unfavorable attention. But it really wasn't from him, it was from Al. Because in May 1902, Casey accepts a job at a bookstore 61 miles away in Bowling Green, Kentucky. And he starts to live at this boarding house with some other young men who were in the various professional fields. While living there, though, he loses his voice again. And Al Lane has to come visit him every Sunday, or he just starts to visit him every Sunday to administer the hypnosis sessions and treatments and also to continue the reading treatments for Lane's other patients. 
So Casey was still worried and tormented that his treating of these patients with real medical problems was not ethical and might even be harmful in some cases. And once again, his soon-to-be wife Gertrude was not very approving of the sessions, but she also didn't insist that they stop at this point. So the reading sessions continued, but they remained as secret as much as possible, and Casey still accepted no money from them. Yeah, and the thing about Gertrude that you get from uh, There is a River, the book, is that she was really protective of him. They had a very sweet mm -hmm. relationship. She really cared about him. He cared about her. They were very enamored with each other. And she was concerned about him being taken advantage of because right. he seemed to be, I think, overly trusting and um, not, and I don't want to say naive because I didn't get the impression that he was. It was more just yeah. like he couldn't say no. If somebody, even to people who maybe were being a little opportunistic when it came to their handling of him or working with him for his readings. And I thought it was an interesting thing, actually. It was the Achilles heel of his gift was that he was unable to do it alone. He had to have yeah. a partner. He had to have someone there doing the interpretation or leading the questions and and just like a remote viewer does it's really fascinating it's really fascinating how and just like the estes method and just like right. well you yeah you have to have a, a guide of some kind and finding that right guide is a very difficult thing to do it, it's yeah. like you and i we guide each other through this show and we got lucky that this works as well as it does <laughs> frankly we didn't plan well, it you know let's leave that to uh others to decide but well yeah yeah uh, and i'm not works. trying to be boastful i'm just saying we no, get no, along no. and oh of course yeah and when you think about what he was doing it's not just this whether or not he was clairvoyant and all of the mysterious spooky things that are going on with it he needs a partner and a partnership that is going to work and people are going to be able to get along for a long time. Like he found with right. Gladys, the, who was the stenographer for 22 years, that worked out yeah. great. So no, of course, if, uh, if he'd been with a partner who just thought that this is crazy, you got to stop doing this. Well, he, I'm sure he, knowing him, he would have stopped and right. that'd be the end of that. And you have to find somebody who is willing to allow you to explore a little. But you can do remote viewing and what Casey did on his own, but it helps to have a guide. You know, How it, is he going to do it on his own, form. though, if he can't even remember well, he what he get, said when he woke up? Yeah, I guess he would have to that record is himself, and who would ask him <laughs> questions? How, how can he do it on his own? Well, that's what I'm saying, is that for that specified treatment where you're asking very specific questions, they have to be, this person has to be guided then that is greatly facilitated by having somebody who is your guide. But Casey also received knowledge on his own while he was asleep. Remember, he would uh, say yes. that he just had With to sleep on it. And, and, yeah, 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 yeah. So it came in a different form. That's what I'm saying is that there are different methods. Uh, there are different ways that this works. And you have to address it completely right for that person or for what your goal is. Otherwise, you're probably going to get stuff that makes no sense. And it reminds me a lot of the Bible code, as skeptics yes. would say, like, well, it doesn't work for everything. And then the people who do believe it works say, well, you're not asking the right questions. I, I want to actually cover that in 2020. It's on the list here. If I can get it past yeah. you and Tess, I, I oh, want to talk course. about the Bible code. It's been out a few no, years it's... now, but for people that don't know about it, it's it's interesting suggestion that you can take the Torah and analyze it in a almost word search kind of pattern. If you arrange it in a matrix and uh, find out things about the past, present, and future. It's very interesting. Right. And so what I know about that, I did read one of the books on it, uh, the, the second one. Drosnan's book? Yes. And the proponents of it will say, if you don't ask the right questions, you will get something that is not a direct answer to what you're asking, and you'll be deflated. You'll, you'll Just be discouraged. Just like Gene Hackman as Lex Luthor in The Fortress of Solitude in <laughs> Superman. He's like, I asked the right question. Right? Just like that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and it and it changed his life. Yes. Well, there was a life-changing experience, or at least that had a profound effect on the career of Edgar Casey, because in August of 1902, Al Lane calls him back to Hopkinsville to work on a case involving a little girl named Amy Dietrich. And this has a, as I said, a profound effect on his entire history as a healer. And you know that story, right? Yeah, this is a pretty fascinating story. This was one of my favorite stories from the book. Um, he, she was one of the earliest people that he wound up helping, and she had uh, the grip, uh, which I was like, oh, I've heard of the grip. Gee. 
But wow. I don't know what this is. So I looked at it. It's actually just an old term for the flu. She had gotten the flu. Okay. And after she got over it, she kept having these convulsions, like seizures. Uh -huh. Her body would get really rigid and she would fall down. And on top of that, her mind had stopped developing since this happened. Oh. And this was going on for two years. It actually had gone on to three years because it was two years of of going to doctors and none of them could figure it out. So by the time they yep. got around to bringing Casey in, it had been that long. And again, we come back to the whole idea of the desperate parent, regardless of how much they believed in what he could do or not do, you're going to try whatever you can if you're sure. a parent and you have this child that's uh, in a state of arrested development and also having issues. So, and this story is interesting because it was all relayed to a Dr. Munsterberg who had come to see Casey uh, from Harvard specifically to debunk him. He was convinced that he was a fraud. And it was- Yeah, you mentioned him earlier. Yes. Yeah. And Amy's mom is the one that told this story to him. So he was a witness uh -huh. to this story. So at the time that this was all going on, Casey had been working in a bookstore. He was not giving readings regularly. It was before all of that. He had no income from it whatsoever. And when they contacted him and said, please come help our little girl, all he asked for was a train ticket to come up there and do the reading for her so he didn't have to pay to get there and back. Mm -hmm. And he went up there and Al C. Lane went with him. And again, this was before they were doing regular readings. This was very early in the process. Munsterberg then asked Amy's mom if Lane was a doctor. He had not been. He, at the time, he was studying osteopathy, which he later graduated in. But she told Munsterberg that Lane would put Edgar in a trance, using the word trance. And Munsterberg mm -hmm. was shocked to learn that neither Lane or Casey examined the little girl, Amy. Neither one of them uh, examined her. And I just wanted to talk about osteopathy a little bit. We we mm -hmm. mentioned it a few times already in the show. This is, again, this is another one of those listed as a pseudoscience in Wikipedia. Yeah. Osteopathy is a type of alternative medicine that emphasizes physical manipulation of muscle, tissue, and bones. Practitioners of osteopathy are referred to as osteopaths. Its name derives from ancient Greek, bone and sensitive to or responding to. The United Kingdom's National Health Service says there is limited evidence that osteopathy may be effective for some types of neck, shoulder, or lower limb pain and recovery after hip or knee operations. But there is no evidence that osteopathy is effective as a treatment for health conditions unrelated to the bones and muscles. Others, however, have concluded that there is insufficient evidence to suggest efficacy for osteopathic style manipulation in treating musculoskeletal pain. So that's yeah. the broad strokes on it, the, the very well, accessible short... Uh, summation of, I guess, the current state of society's uh, opinion yeah, on osteopathy. There are some osteopaths, though, that do use more modern Western medical techniques and pharmaceuticals in addition to their practice that are more accepted. So it has gained more acceptance, I think, over the years, is what I'm saying. In yes. That. But Casey also, some of his readings, I remember uh, way back when reading some of the treatments, I believe he recommended chiropractic measures to be taken for some people and yes. a bit of osteopathic treatment himself in that massage. Uh, he was a proponent, uh, or at least the readings were a proponent of massage and skeletomuscular manipulation to affect some healing. Yes. And, you know, but nowadays, yeah, I, from what I've read there, there are more traditional medicine techniques for the Western medicine practice that are incorporated. So it's a little more accepted than it was back then. Well, coming back to Amy's story, her mom was pretty skeptical of Casey's whole situation because he looked really young at the time and boyish, but she was desperate to help her little girl. The reading began with, yes, we have the body. Now in this reading, Casey explained that the day before Amy came down with the flu, she had actually hurt her spine getting out of a carriage and that the grip or flu had affected the injured area. The fact was that the girl's fall was real benign looking when it happened. The mom had witnessed it herself, and it was so insignificant in appearance that she really hadn't thought much of it, and neither had the little girl. She immediately hopped up and seemed fine. Additionally, the mom was the only one who knew about it besides the girl who had probably forgotten it even happened three years earlier, and she hadn't really spoken much since then anyway because, again, she was in a state of arrested development. There was no way for Casey to have known that that little girl had fallen on that day, and on top of that, it didn't look like a serious fall. Casey explained in the reading that she would need an osteopathic adjustment to get better. Mr. Lane then proceeded to make what he thought was the right adjustment. In another reading, Casey made it clear the adjustment hadn't been done right and what Lane needed to do to make it right. Lane then tried again, and Casey told the family that Amy would get better. 
A week later, the fog from the girl's brain went away as she, according to the book, recalled the name of a doll that she played with a lot just before she had become sick. She then remembered the names of her parents for the first time in what had been three years, recovering to the mental capacity of a normal five-year-old. By the time Sugru wrote his book, Amy was 15 years old and 100% healthy. In fact, Dr. Munsterberg met her. Amy's mom went on to defend Casey's character, explaining to Munsterberg that he was no charlatan, but a pillar of the Christian church who had never taken advantage of anyone. Now, for me, I had some thoughts about this once I read this story. Mm -hmm. The skeptic's immediate view often seems more focused on the idea that someone is trying to put something over on someone, and that was Munsterberg's point of view, rather than actually trying to deconstruct whether or not what is rumored is possible or not, or if it may or may not work. In my opinion, this is an aggressive form of confirmation bias that afflicts many of the skeptics that we come across in the legends we cover. They seem to be blinded by their need for cognitive closure and a seemingly inherent belief that anything that is unexplained is rooted in the opinion that whomever is claiming to have witnessed or conducted it is doing that simply for fame and fortune, neither of which Edgar Cayce ever sought. In fact, he aggressively attempted to avoid both. So then what is his motive? Dr. Monsterberg, if he was as he is portrayed in Sugru's book, which we have to consider he may not have been because, as we said, Sugru is obviously firmly biased into Cayce's corner, but if he is as he was represented, he didn't appear to be trying to ascertain anything more than proof that Edgar Casey was tricking people. Because in his mind, he had already decided, before he even arrived, that what Casey was doing was impossible. But I don't want to get too far into the weeds there on the mm -hmm. skeptical viewpoint of all his... We're going to talk about that uh, more mm -hmm. in episode two, which I know we tried to stop saying in this show, and we've said it 50 what, billion times There's going to be here. more of episode two? Yeah, the world. We're, we're going to talk about more later. We're going to get to that? We're going to talk about it later. Yes, we're going to get to it. Some people have even started a <laughs> yeah. drinking game with that, which I, uh, as I understand, they are now in rehab. So anyway... Yeah, but they'll uh, get to that later. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that later. <laughs> anyway, so that's my opinion yeah. about Munsterberg and a lot of the... Right. And, and it's not just Munsterberg, it's... Every time we, not every time, but a lot of the times yeah. we see these people are coming in to investigate and their approach is not based on an objective deconstruction of what's happening. It's more based on starting from the idea that what is happening is patently impossible. So yeah. every assessment I, I make from this point forward is rooted in an inconclusion that I've already made. So why are you even going? If it's impossible, why yeah. are you even investigating it? What's the point? Well, that's what I'm saying is that, that the wacky, the woo-woo is not on the table for yeah. consideration. It's not even a number that could be put into the equation. So it's totally left out. And I go back to that old Michael Shermer saying, you know, maybe there is 10% or, or 12 or 13 that we just can't figure out, just makes no sense. So we put that aside. Yes. And that's taking it off the table. Well, okay, that's part of the equation that you need to figure out. You need to get at that unknown here. But it's not easy, and I understand, can be fruitless and frustrating because you may never get an answer for that. Like, where exactly is this information coming from through Casey? Well, here's a little anecdote that points out to what you said about him being maybe a little bit naive or really just actually trusting. I don't think he was all that naive. I think he was just that trusting sort. Just a just nice a, guy. Yeah. Yeah, a real Southern gentleman and somebody who was genuinely nice and didn't believe or wanted to trust people that they were going to do right by everybody. Here's a story, though, which I think you will really enjoy because I think we talked about this before. Edgar Casey invents a card game called Pit. It's also known as Board of Trade, which is patterned after stock trading in the wheat market. Do you remember that game? Yeah, I have, I know this game. It's weird. I've never played it, but it's famous yeah. enough that I just know it. I know of its name and that sort yeah. of thing. And I, I, I know think people we, that had it. It's, it's right. amazing. We, yeah, yeah I, I believe long time ago. I mean, it's an old game, but what's interesting is that, you know, it was a hit back then. It got to be very popular in its day, and a version of it is still available to this day for yeah. purchase. And so we had to, you know, as a kid growing up in, in our era here, you had various card games. Uh, Uno was one that was later on, though. But early on, we had Touring. Remember that? It was a, a Yep. And it was a French, actually based on a French card game of the same kind of thing. Uh, Les Milliers or something. Um, I, uh, that's not Italian, but there were various card games. Pitt was one of them, and he invented it. Sadly, though, Casey, being trusting and not that savvy with how large companies work, he sent the concept to a board game company. They copyrighted it, and Casey got no money from it. 
And unfortunately for Edgar Casey and his family, finances will be a problem soon here and for a large part of his life. And he's still not accepting money for his readings. Of course, this reminds me of Jump to Conclusions. Yes. From the movie Office Space. <laughs> Office. Remember they called classic. <laughs> they called Jumping classic. Jumping to Conclusions. Yes. That's right. If you hadn't seen it, it's the guy's side business where it's like he's going to invent this board game. And I think that actually in the movie, he does become successful with it, doesn't he? Yes. After he gets in a car crash, he's like in a That's body <laughs> cast. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's kind of a, a bit of a, uh, you know, consolation prize for him. But it, you never know with people. People invent all kinds of fun stuff and sometimes it takes off. And this did take off the game of Pit. Just not with Edgar Casey tied to it. That company made a lot of money, and whoever owns the rights to it. It also reminds me of a story, a, a little side anecdote here, about William T. Phillips, who was an author, inventor, and mechanical engineer who had moved to Spokane, Washington, and worked for a time at the Riblet Company, which manufactured ski lifts and other gondola-type lifts. Phillips had invented a mechanical adding machine, which he then sent a prototype of to the office machine company Pitney Bowes. You heard of them? Oh, yeah. Yeah, pretty big. Well, guess what they did? They reverse engineered it, patented it, made a fortune off of it, and Phillips never saw a dime from it. <laughs> or so the legend goes. Also, I don't know if it was actually the company Pitney Bowes. Could have been Burroughs. But <laughs> and William Burroughs, the author, had some connection to that as well. Right. I'm just making this all up. But what I do know is that here's an interesting twist. William T. Phillips also authored a book called The Bandit Invincible, which was a biography of the Old West outlaw and rascal Butch Cassidy. And many have suspected that William T. Phillips actually was Butch Cassidy. But that's a whole nother show. Uh, yes, it is. And that's a <laughs> rare and hard to get book. But you know who is has it? Oh, did you find it? Oh, yeah. You did find it. Oh, yeah. I got it. I got it. Okay. And, uh, yeah, Butch might be on our radar. Anyway. All right, then. Yeah. Yes. Well, on June 17th of 1903, Edgar Casey marries Gertrude Evans in Hopkinsville, and they end up living in Bowling Green, having three children, as we had previously mentioned. Future home but of a few Corvette. Sorry. <laughs> oh, that's I mean, right. Bowling Green, you got to say Corvette. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. It's, just, it's in it, my blood. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a museum there, right? <laughs> yes. Didn't yes. They have a and that's where they hole? produced them. Yeah. And yeah. yes, there was a sinkhole that swallowed millions of dollars <laughs> worth of uh, priceless Corvettes. But uh, that's And it's all, that's yeah. all on a security camera if you're bored. All right. Oh, that's right. Yes, yes. of course. Yeah. <laughs> well, anywho, uh, that happened then. His, his childhood sweetheart of a sort from Hopkinsville. But a few days after the wedding, Al Lane discussed the sessions with Casey to some of the young professional men we mentioned before who were living at that boarding house, two of which were doctors, and one was a magistrate and journalist who reported Lane to the state medical authorities, who then forced him to stop practicing medicine. Lane then leaves for Franklin, Kentucky to become a professional osteopath. The doctors living at the boarding house, though, did help to ease any negative attention towards Casey with their support. One thing I want to say about this, and when I was reading about this in Sugru's book, it struck mm -hmm. a chord of familiarity with me because my great-grandparents had a boarding house in Raleigh, North Carolina. Oh, uh -huh. It was a 28-room colonial-style mansion with a wraparound porch in uh, downtown Raleigh in an area called Boylan Heights. It's since been torn down, but the interesting thing is I remember growing up, they, there was only one or two boarders left when I moved back to North Carolina and was close to them when I was nine years old in uh, 1980 or 79 or 80 or whatever. And I remember hearing the stories. There was a guy, and I think I've mentioned on the show before, that one of the tenants still lived there and he lived under the porch. <laughs> Well, no, he you actually lived under before. the porch. Yeah. His name was Fred, remember, yeah. super nice guy. Right. But what I was going to say is there's an interesting social culture that goes on in yeah. these houses where everyone's living together, but it's adults of all different disciplines working and living together. And you can just imagine what this felt like for him and these people that were you know, out to get him or to defend him in this house. It's, right. it's an interesting dynamic, I think. No, absolutely. It's it, Well, what you saw in uh, It's a Wonderful Life, he goes to Ma's boarding house and his mom doesn't recognize him, remember? And, yes. Uh, well, it, it seems Al Lane, he, he skated by a little bit. I mean, it's not like these people had actually hurt anybody, but he was under investigation to a degree by somebody at this boarding house whose duty it probably was to report this and it went up the ranks and then it came back down. It's like, you got to stop doing that, whatever you're doing. So he goes to actually get some professional training, Al Lane, other than his hypnosis techniques and therapy. But that didn't really happen for Casey. No, it didn't. And I think you can, you can understand why 
there needs to be some sort of regulation because there are folks out there who are taking advantage of people, taking money from people. So you could understand why, even if Casey had the best of intentions and Al Lane maybe as well, that there does need to be oversight to make sure that people aren't being taken advantage of who might be more gullible about how they can be helped if they're having some sort of problem. So you can see why an investigation might occur. But on the other hand, it leaves very little room for folks who maybe are altruistic and trying to do the right thing. And in this case, Al Lane, as you said, did skate by, but things were about to get pretty bad for Edgar Casey. He never really had a huge success with what he was trying to do, and there was a whole lot of hardship coming his way in the future. One of the worst things that was going to happen to him before too long is that he was going to be arrested for fortune-telling in a sting operation by two undercover female police officers who had gone to him pretending to seek help. More on that next week. That's going to wrap up part one of our three-part series on Edgar Casey. We'll be back next week with part two. Please remember to support our sponsors. They help keep the show free and the lights on in Blanket Fortiana. Special thanks to John Bolin. Hi, I'm Jen Pakovich. Hey, I've got a joke for you. Why did the skinwalker cross the road? Give up to get to the parallel dimension. But um Tonight's show was edited by Chris Potter at rumblejar.com and co-produced by Tess Feifel, who is also our head of research. Our theme, which is available as a ringtone, was composed by Judson Crane, and our sound design and additional composing is by Ryan McCullough. Special thanks to the Astonishing Research Corps. But most importantly, we want to thank you, our listeners. Visit our store at astonishinglegends.com or interact with us and other listeners on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can also support the show at patreon.com slash astonishinglegends, where patrons have access to additional bonus content. No part of this show may be reproduced anywhere without permission. Copyright Astonishing Legends Productions. Good night. <laughs>